10 law there and then we're just going to keep putting bodies on the board the prince john's another prince john less working yeah a little <laughs> less working with uh, with albert being in top deck mode but uh, it's still just a body that quests for two i think we sometimes forget that prince john just quests for two um you know it's still a, still a great quester so we've got four uh five six seven eight nine it's a lot of lore on the board right now Seven, eight, nine. You're right. Yeah, nine lore on the board, and, and just wow, has the answer every time. <laughs> and that nine. was a nice, beautiful, enchanted. Um, and then along came along Zeus came that he Zeus. just played. That uh, was. And does Albert have anything? He does not. Yeah, no. Nope. Looking for the bee prep because it's uh, the only thing that's yep. really going to give him any chance to keep him. But yeah, I think it's going to be a shuffle up and go to game two. So Alexandra, just showing the power of discard there. Can get some of those answers that he needs with that Ruby Amethyst. We know that it's such a strong deck, and uh, but Emerald Steel was just kind of steamrolling over everything that he brought out. Yeah, just had the answers. Albert can can take a win here, I think. The, the, the Ruby Amethyst uh, is just the most consistent deck in the format. It doesn't necessarily have... Uh, any incredible matchups where it just really runs over things, but it doesn't really have any terrible matchups. It has all of the, um, it just has all of the sort of solid answers uh, throughout. Just got to see them when you need them, really. Obviously, uh, the main uh, issues for Albert here is knowing that the discard is coming. So uh, you may well yeah. see, like, be prepared, uh, you know, got rid of earlier in the game, mulliganed away, definitely, but even, uh, you know, used, uh, uh, you know, got rid of as, as much as possible because it just isn't going to survive in your hand until you need it. Uh, hopefully he'll be able to find it when he needs it, if he needs it. And the same with things like friends as well. Sure. Yeah, so Albert, you know, he's not playing a very aggressive deck, but it feels like that might be some of the strategy to get lore early against an emerald steel that can just really get going mid late game exactly yeah i mean a lot of the uh, emerald steel's answers early game are the are, are the steel removal spells so it doesn't really matter whether your characters are exerted or not when they're as yeah. far as they're concerned so you may as well just start getting that early value out of them and exactly what we see here rafiki a challenger you know the, the a card that really is there in the game to deal with board presence, but here uh, it just becomes a quester because early on Albert knows that that early lead is going to uh, really pay off. Yeah, and Alexandra didn't have anything on turn one, but now he's playing an Ursula and can take a look. And Albert does not have any songs, but we do see two Queen's Castles, a fox, and a mini mouse. Yeah. Uh, so it's good to know for Alex. Uh, I think, I wonder if we'll maybe keep hold of those. Uh, castles this time we saw a few of them get inked in the last game but i do actually think they're quite a good answer here alex kind of needs the along came zeus for them uh, no we're still deciding to ink one of them uh, but it's still a perfectly fine play um and then we get a mini down which is going to be a really great quester again uh, is we're going to be requiring a steel removal answer here yeah those locations can do a lot of work and like you said really you have along came zeus and then until he can get some bigger bodies on the board uh, on Alexandria's side, there's uh, those Queen's Castles would do a lot of good. They would probably yeah. last a couple turns at least. And get I, I feel so. I, I feel like it, yeah. Uh, we ink a, a Robin Hood for an Ursula Deceiver of All, and we're going to cut away just for a moment. Uh, there was a judge call at that point in the game. Um, nothing major. We were just... But now... So the Ursula Deceiver coming down there from Alexandru. Uh, and now I think it's back over to Albert. And once again, I just have to point out the beautiful enchanted Ursula Deceiver of All that he's played here. Um, one of the most beautiful enchanted arts, I think, of of that, that Into the Inkland set, that Ursula is fantastic. And that's the one with the joint art, I think, by John Lauren and yes. Nicholas Cole. And who, Nicholas Cole. Yeah, I mean, both smash it in their own rights, but when they They're, come together, they make some yep. amazing stuff. <laughs> And we do see the Queen's Castle come down. I think that was a good move for Albert to bring that onto the board. So I think so as well. It may well have just been that uh, the other one needed to be inked the turn before because that mini mouse yeah. is going to put a lot of uh, questing work in again. You see Albert here just kind of really keep the tempo up as far as questing goes, the uh, the mini mouse and the Cusco, and there the castle down as well with Alex not really having a great answer for it um, unless we do see uh, the, um, the Along Came Zeus. Yeah, and if he could double sing along came Zeus, that would be... <laughs> uh, luckily, you can't. <laughs> uh, luckily, it's a four drop, so Ursula isn't able to. Oh, that's right, uh, yes, Although she, yes. is, uh, she is double singing rent, uh, Strength of a Raging Fire, I think. 
Oh, he's inking uh, Strength of oh, Raging inking fire, fire, and he's doing Let the Storm Rage On on Rafiki and Cusco. So he will get to draw off of Cusco. Uh, you know, Rafiki, he he gained like three lore. I think yep. he was out there for a few turns. So Absolutely got some work in there, and then yes. Alex obviously draws two cards there with, uh, with uh, Let the Storm Rage On being played twice. And then we see Age of Far Dreadnought coming down as well. And he's singing with his other Ursula, Sudden Chill. So uh, Albert's going to have to discard. And we see Lady Lynch Tremaine. Rain. All right. So we get two lore off the castle. Um, so it's I feel like that was quite a turn. strong turn there for Alexandru. Huge turn. Yeah. Got a lot of uh, a lot of uh, work going on there. Was able to clear up uh, two characters off the board, uh, discarded a card from Albert, drew two cards himself, developed his own board state, yeah, just did everything that Emerald Steel wants to do. Yeah, and even though he's still sitting at zero lore, as we've seen in previous games, uh, he he kind of tends to sit back there for a while and then just ramps up real quick. And we see a fox being inked there for a Maui, which takes out that Ursula. Have enough singing from her right now. <laughs> and then the, uh, the mouse continues to quest there on her surfboard. Yeah, Minnie is a great, great little card. She's just a one three, I believe, and but she quests for two. And being evasive, um, she can do a lot of questing. And character wise, I don't think there's any evasive characters that um, Alexandra has. But of course, he has all the all the damage songs that he could bring in to take care of Minnie Mouse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's definitely what uh, what he needs to see here is is some sort of steel removal for her. There's uh, a lot in there um, that stuff's going to be able to deal with. Strength of Rage and Fire, as long as his board state is big enough. Along came Zeus uh, also as well. So uh, definitely answers, but um, Albert's just going to keep questing with her until uh, Alex finds one. Yeah. yeah. Minnie Mouse is also one of those cards that every time I play it, it just makes me smile. She's just so cute on her surfboard. <laughs> yeah, I love how all the minis just seem to be living their best life in this game. They, they're, they're, I they're think out of... And... Yes, all the mini characters. It's like if I was going to hang out with a Disney character in Lorcana for a day, I would absolutely choose Minnie Mouse. She's having <laughs> the most fun. Uh, Bucky there coming down and being the third character so that Strength of Raging Fire deals three to her. And then Jafar... Uh, finishing off Maui there. So again, another good turn. Uh, both players really playing at the height of their games here, I think. They're both uh, seeing the uh, the cards they need when they need them and playing into their outs. Um, but yeah, we, we've sort of seen a replay of the of the game one here. Early law lead for Albert, but then yes. Alex just being able to uh, start to take control of the game the longer it goes on. I think the fact that he played that Queen's Castle, though, a, a couple turns ago was really smart because even though uh, Alexander's been able to clear his board of characters, that's still gaining him lore every turn. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, uh, Rabbit here to draw a card and then moved over to the castle. One of my uh, favorite so moves. The castle survives the <laughs> turn, which it, I'm pretty sure it will do at this point. Um, we're going to see a lot of card draw next turn. Let's see, he's exerting four. And along came Zeus is going to do five damage there and then take it out all the way with Ursula. Yeah, that's uh, that's the answer he needed for it at that point. Uh, so at this point, again, Alex is going to try and put some bit more stuff down on the board and, and hopefully bring the tempo back into his favor. Uh, just a lone rabbit there for Albert. Um, uh, yeah, but still cards in hand, which at this point in the game against a discard yes. deck is, is pretty impressive. <laughs> yep, so he has five ink, and he just exerted for to play another rabbit for a card draw. He hasn't inked this turn. We do see him put a mini into his inkwell. Quest of the rabbit, keep that lower pressure on. Uh, again, obviously, if the if the rabbit does get taken out by something, you're drawing a card as well, so you don't necessarily mind turning that sideways. So with with six ink, he does have. Um, I'm not sure what he has in hand, but Lady Tremaine and Madame Medusa are both in his deck. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> I was gonna say he didn't have a good target for either. You know, maybe the Bucky, but with Beast coming down now, that's <laughs> yeah, that's pretty big. The uh, tragic hero coming down, and then obviously Bucky seeing that tragic hero to discard. The Pinocchio, um, and now I think we're in there. No, we have one card in hand, I think, so we're not quite yeah. into top deck mode, uh, but we will be after inking the mini. Uh, and for there's the Meta the Medusa. Medusa. We'll get rid That's, of the beast, yeah. yeah, that was the answer that Albert needed for sure there with that beast. And he didn't even, I don't think Alexandra got even a, a single card draw off of Beast, so that's really fortunate for Albert because that extra card draw from Beast is so, so um, advantageous. Absolutely. 
Uh, it was a really great couple of turns from Albert. Managed to build up a decent board state here. Oh, we see a Beast Relentless, which I think is the first time seeing mm -hmm. this. A fantastic card in Emerald. Uh, Beast Relentless says that you can ready him whenever another character takes damage. It can Actually, any character can take damage. He can take it himself. It can be one of yours. It can be one of your opponents. And they can take damage through any different way. Uh, it doesn't matter. And he just gets to ready. And not only that, uh, the real key thing for this one is that he can still quest once readying. A lot of the readying stuff in the game uh, will say they can't quest for the rest of this turn. Beast doesn't say that. So there's definitely uh, some really fun lines you can do with a lot of the steel uh, removal spells and Beast, uh, not only being able to clean up the board, but instead also now getting lore as well uh, with, the, uh, with the Beast readying. Yes, we did see a little bit of bounce there. So he quested with Rabbit, bounced it back with Fox, and then replayed it. So we got to draw a couple cards there, which is good. And he's didn't quest with anything, though, before passing the turn over to Alexandru. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I think at this point, he's going to have to start thinking about what that beast is able to do. Uh, obviously, if you're giving your opponent targets to damage, I mean, even that mm -hmm. Ursula going into something and not uh, banishing it, it's still going to have that beast be ready and uh, can very quickly get out of hand. Here we do see the beginning of that sort of combo happen. Uh, Beast is able to quest for two, readies, and then um, uh, let the Storm Rage on there, he's drawing a card. That's game. Yeah, but, yeah uh, Albert had enough lore on board, so... Yeah, and I didn't Al have an answer for it, so that was, uh, that was great. So best of luck to both Alexandru and Albert. It really is anybody's game. And it's going to be exciting to see what, what we got here. So it looks like they've already altered their opening hands. And Alexandra will lead us off. We got a fist bump going into it's the, the final game. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> nice, bit of, uh, nice bit of camaraderie going into the, uh, into the final game of the three here. Absolutely. You know, the, the Lorcana community is just so fantastic. Everyone I've met um, online and at my LGS has been so wonderful. And I love to see things like that with folks in the community just really supporting each other, even though we're competing. Uh, you know, it is a Disney card game and and there's so much camaraderie and support and encouragement among players, uh, all the Illumineers, you know, we're all, we're all here to have fun. Absolutely. It's really great to see. So uh, no turn one play from either player here, but we do see a bookie come down from Alex. And um, yeah, exactly what the deck wants to do. And we're going to hopefully start seeing the uh, the Floodborne targets for him soon. Um, yeah, there's going to be, you'll probably see a slow, slightly slower pace of play here. Um, that, you know, that this, this, this is going to be the game, the one that takes them into the, into yes. the next round. So every line is going to be looked at. Every line of play is going to be thought about and considered. Uh, and that's absolutely fine. Sometimes it's worth just sort of taking a step back, slowing down, really looking at what your options are. So. Yeah. I do see a spell book that, over there in Albert's hand. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if he, he ends up playing that because that's just some nice lore gain. And I don't think that Alexandra really has any answers for items in his deck. No, obviously, uh, item removal is, is most prevalent in steel out of any other color, really. But yeah, it doesn't look like we're seeing any uh, in Alex's deck. Uh, if there's Bengers, they haven't shown themselves yet. Albert might be uh, realizing that and thinking it can come down a little bit and just start a lore game. That social spell book is usually there for the mirror match, honestly. Uh, it's just a way of, so like you say, just kind of keeping that lore gain high when uh, your characters are constantly sort of trading into each other. But instead, we go for a Maleficent, uh, drawing a card, just keeping that handful, very aware that there might be some discard stuff coming from Alex. Yeah, I do see a sudden chill that he has inking, or is he singing it? He's inking it, it looks like, and he has a Strength of Raging Fire there, and he does have that Ursula out, so... Yep, so we're using the uh, Sudden Chill to play a Robin Hood. We do have the shift target in hand, so that's setting up for next turn's play. And then Ursula is going to be doing uh, a ton of damage uh, across both of the characters there. That's um, that's really quite solid, yeah. Three damage to each, uh, having that Robin Hood come down. Yeah, so Strength or Raging Fire, again, it does damage equal to the amount of characters that you have in play. So mm -hmm. uh, it can be very strong. Yeah, uh, safe to relatively safe to quest with Bucky here. Obviously, there's a lot of rush. Uh, it, well, I said there's a lot of rush. There's Fox in Albert's deck, but Fox does need a target on the board uh, <laughs> yes, to be able yes. to bounce back. <laughs> so while Albert uh, has an empty board, it's fairly fairly safe uh, until you get to five and hit that Maui uh, area. Uh, it's probably quite safe to, to, to quest here. Uh, we see a goat come down from Albert. Again, just going to try and keep that law gain rolling uh, against Alex. Yeah. 
And that Ursula, this is first, I feel like this is one of the first games we've seen where Ursula has survived a, a couple turns, which is really dangerous. And if he gets more of those steel songs in hand, could cause a lot of trouble for Albert. Absolutely. Uh, so we see the Robin uh, Hood shift there. Uh, it's just going to start questing. Uh, Robin, again, we've said it all day, a toolbox card is able to quest, is able to challenge, just does everything uh, it says on the tin, uh, just able yes. to just play into <laughs> lots of different play styles, do exactly what it needs to do depending on the board state, and here just able to comfortably uh, quest. We see, although we wow. do see a really great trade there with Goat uh, being bumped up by the Crab, so that's taking out, uh, you know, a big target there. Alex has put a, you know, a few, quite a bit of resources into that Robin Hood. Uh, Goat is gaining lore as he leaves as well, so yeah, it's a, a pretty solid uh, trade there, I think, from Albert. Yeah, I think not letting that Robin Hood sit around uh, is a smart move. He is the champion of Sherwood, after all. Sure is. <laughs> uh, we see a Prince John coming down. Again, we now have the Bucky and John online. So any Floodborne is going to have a card discarded by Albert and a card drawn from Alex. Uh, so a really great two-card combo there. Yeah. What do you think these players, you know, this we're at the quarterfinals, this is final eight, game three. Uh, how do you think they're feeling nerves and uh, just their mental state right now at this place in the tournament? I, so this is the this is the real key uh, match moving into the final. Although this is if this is top eight, uh, they've all they've secured a um, uh, Mickey Mouse Brave Little Taylor at this point, I believe. That is true. Yes, uh, you know, and 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 in, for me personally, that's the that's the prize <laughs> for these. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, uh, the higher you go up, the more packs you get, the extra, uh, the full set of foils and and enchanted, and there is a trophy for first as well. Uh, but really, if I was coming into this uh, and really trying to make it all the way, uh, I would be able to personally have a little bit of a sigh of relief once I once I guaranteed myself one of those Mickey's. Uh, but even still, you know, it's it's one of the top tables of the day. Uh, you're yeah. on. Uh, Dream. You've got a, a thousand people watching, or however many it is. Um, yeah, so the pressure is definitely going to be on. Uh, and obviously, you know, different players react to that differently, right? Sure, absolutely. And, and I know a lot of players, um, especially some of these uh, players that are at this high level, have come from other games and probably have some experience playing at, in tournaments. And so I'm sure that that experience really helps with things like nerves and all of that. So for newer players to tournaments, you know, the more you play, the more you're out there, then uh, the more comfortable you get in these situations. Absolutely. We got six law or six, excuse me, six ink over here on, on Albert's inkwell. So he is one ink away from being able to be prepared if he has it in hand. I don't think I've seen it in his hand yet. No, is, oh, going to be... is that it? There it is. It is definitely going to be an answer he's looking for at this point. Alex's board yep. is uh, starting to get a little bit away from him. So I think maybe a, a reset here is probably needed. Yeah, he has it. He must have just drawn it. What do you do? You think that's the right move here to quest out with a rabbit and crab and and wipe the board? Uh, it may well be, yeah, because the Ursula being able to sing next turn uh, is 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 a lot of pressure, especially if that's a, a discard card. Prince John is going to refuel the hand again. Uh, if you quest with Rabbit or Crab, you're going to be giving uh, Alex value with the Jafar trading into them. So, uh, yeah, I think there's something to be said about having a bit of a reset here, but um, maybe not. Maybe we'll see another line. Instead, we see a Rabbit come down um, for another draw. Sure. Perhaps looking for a better inkable so that next turn we can be prepared. That may well be is as well. Uh, we see a Pinocchio is able to exert the Ursula. Crab is able to go in there. So that's a, uh, a pretty nice challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, maybe just seeing the line there and being able to keep board presence up whilst removing the bigger threats from Alex's board is, uh, is some really good play. Sure. Yeah, keeping those characters in place so he can keep questing. Uh, in now that he was able to see that he could take Ursula off the board, maybe he feels like there's not as much of a threat there on on the other side. Absolutely. Uh, we see six oh, here for a, a uh, giant tink. tink. Finishes off the uh, the crab there and takes out the Pinocchio. Puts one on each of the rabbits. So, yeah, pretty solid turn there. Not shifted. We, we rarely see the shift target for uh, Tinkerbell there. We, it was something that was played a lot earlier in the uh, earlier sets, metas. 
Uh, but now a lot of the time you're you're just kind of happy putting her down on six as a uh, a, as a good body then uh, a lot of the time earlier on you would play the tiny tactician to get her out on four Uh, but the game uh, as it's developed has moved a little slower for the most part unless you're sort of up against a real aggro deck Um, so usually you're more than happy to have her come down on six actually and it looks like, yeah, Alex is not running those tiny tacticians in his deck. So uh, you can play it on, on six or you could shift onto morph if you really wanted to. Absolutely. Yeah, if there was a morph down, it would have been a nice shift because it would have cleaned up those rabbits because uh, she'd have been able to quest in and then, uh, sorry, challenge in and then do the two damage to the other one. Uh, but even still, the Jafar able to take, take the one out and then draw a card is, is really quite good. Oh, it looks like a Be Prepared might be coming here. He just quested, yeah. and there it is. There it is. So we get a card draw off the rabbit uh, for Albert, and then Alex uh, gets a hard reset. Uh, just in time, I think, there, the Be Prepared yeah. for, uh, for Albert. I did see, it looked like a Beast Relentless. Ah, and there it is in his hand. So it's something to watch out for. Yeah. Uh, now, if he is. had a Tremaine or a, well, Medusa wouldn't do it, I don't believe, but a uh, Tremaine would be very nice here. I think he's going to wimble it down off the board. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure whether that was the top deck. I feel like it might have been the way it might came, have been. Uh, the way it came down. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, the response needed there. She is one of my favorite ladies in chairs. Yeah. And a long time Zeus. Yeah. Back and forth, the long time to taking it out. We do have a couple to uh, left over for a sudden chill. There we get rid of the fox. fox. So we got yeah, these two empty players. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's like a really a reset here. Yeah, and just, <laughs> and just uh, single digit law total. So you, you wouldn't think we were as late into the game as you would, uh, other than looking at the ink. We see a castle come down and a Cusco and enough to move the ca- uh, Cusco to the castle. Great turn from Albert. That's going to be a really yes. good way to uh, uh, to start getting back into this game with law gain and most likely card draw as well, uh, unless Alex finds another along game Zeus. Yeah, if he had a, another Let the Storm Rage on, he's played a couple this game. I'm not sure how many he, he might have left, but he could, um, you know, take out that Cusco if he wanted. But I'm sure he's wanting to get a body on the board so he can uh, keep up with questing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, these players, they're, they're thinking hard, looking at, at what's out. Another Tinkerbell. Yeah. Uh, again, mostly just getting this down as a big body at this point, I feel. Uh, it does obviously take a little bit of damage into that Cusco, but we do see a card draw and two lore off the castle there. It just shows you what a great uh, comeback card it is after a Be Prepared. I know we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but uh, a lot of people saw locations and were like, oh, these are Be Prepared proof and <laughs> thought that we'd see played against Be Prepared. But actually, no, we don't. We see them in the same deck as Be Prepared here with the castle. Yes, uh, just absolutely. as a really great way to uh, to start to refuel your game uh, after <laughs> after doing one. So uh, another, a mini is a great line there as well. And a Rafiki just putting stuff down onto the board. Moving um, them I both over. I don't, and, and why not? Yeah, you, you've you got the ink to do it. You may as well move stuff across there just for that card draw. I don't believe Alex is running uh, Grab Your Swords, so it's not so awful going a little wider here with uh, with some smaller characters uh, as far as Albert is concerned. Yeah, that Tinkerbell over there is, well, that he can't do anything now because he doesn't have anything exerted. So the Queen's Castle, yep, would be the only thing that he could he could do some damage on. Yeah, and along came Zeus, did find it, and uh, was able to get rid of it. So that's, you know, that's kind of huge there. It stops the two law game, but also it would have been three card draw. Yes, <laughs> that. yes. Um, yes. So ab- absolutely was the right <laughs> play. And, you know, arguably the, the downside of the locations is that uh, they don't crack back, you know, so you are able to put some resources into getting rid of them, and, and, it, and it's usually a relatively fair trade. Obviously leaves that Tinkerbell open there. Uh, we're going to put Cusco into her, mostly because uh, Cusco does draw you a card on uh, on Banish. So again, we're just digging through, seeing answers. Uh, this is really good. We can see some great play here. Rafiki goes in as well. Um, I don't suppose he would like to put the mini into her. I think we're going to quest instead there. Yeah, uh, but just putting that damage on her now, meaning next turn, uh, that Rafiki then is threatening to to finish uh, finish her half. The, uh, the surfer there obviously being evasive, so Tinkerbell currently isn't able to go into her. 
Yeah. I think a lot of players feel like, uh, especially newer players, that if you're going to challenge a character that you want to be able to take it out in one swoop. But here we see him just putting uh, some damage on, on Tinkerbell, not taking her completely out. Um, and like you said, so then next turn, if Tink t- decides to challenge into one of his characters um, or it, quest, then he can take her out, you know? So th- yeah. there's a little bit of that forward thinking, you know, that you don't Absolutely. have to do everything all at once. Uh, we managed to find the third along came Zeus. Uh, that's the that's the three of them now played. That's uh, th- Alex is running three copies of that, and we've managed to see all of them in this game. So, uh, really, he's the king of the top decks here today. Just absolutely yes. finding those answers as he needs them. Um, all right. So we have a quest uh, from Rafiki, which suggests another be prepared, and it yes, is. Yeah, and it is. Yep. Uh, not quite as much value out of that one as uh, as he got from the first one, I think, but still uh, absolutely fair to do there at that point, getting rid of that Tinkerbell uh, and the Prince John. Uh, okay. Ursula takes a look at no songs, but we see a rabbit. Madam Medusa, I think. There we go. You're a bit quicker than me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah we'll Mad- we'll, Madam Medusa. Yeah, I was going to say, we'll see that Medusa come down, take out the yep. Ursula. And yeah, this is going to be a real back and forth game. Albert just creeping ahead with the law now at this point, uh, but there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of back and forth now. Albert just able to uh, keep hold of some cards in hand. Uh, yeah, we, uh, there's sing, the friends. Seeing friends with Medusa is kind of huge at this point, which is going to refuel his hand. Uh, but I feel like uh, Albert's going to really start pulling away with this now. Yeah, cards it... in hand, better body on the board, uh, more card draw. Uh, all the ink he needs to do stuff with. Yeah, I think it's probably in Albert's favor, but we'll see. And he's going to bounce that rabbit back for another draw. Yeah, yeah. he's just, you know, a, a minute ago, he only had one or two cards in hand, and now it looks like he's has a, a full hand. <laughs> Almost up to a full hand again. Just uh, Amethyst doing Amethyst things with the best yes. package and the card draw there. Yeah, and just able to, again, extend back out again with Minnie Mouse and Rafiki. Oh, wow. And uh, so not so great. Some top decks here, double Bucky. I mean, if we do see a Floodborne, it's going to start emptying out Albert's hand. But at this point, I think he's... Uh, kind of safe just being able to start questing out a little bit here. Uh, those bookies just, they're just not, they're not quite, they're not challengers, you know, they're just not there to uh, to challenge into stuff. So uh, if that's all that's on the board, definitely going to be able to start gaining some lore here and really put in the pressure on. We see a rabbit come down, we see a castle come uh, down. Castle. Yeah. Just absolutely closing this out, I think. Yeah. Uh, again, He's a four in to four really eight. good shape. What do you think Alex is looking for here? Uh, a miracle, I think, honestly. I, I, <laughs> fortunately for Alex, I, I can't really think of too many lines here that are going to help. Uh, again, we're not see, we're not running Grab Your Sword, which isn't going to get rid of some uh, stuff in a big way. Uh, Tragic Beast is a good card here to empty Albert's hand uh, from two cards, but at the minute, four, five, six, seven, we still have enough on the board. Albert still has yes. seven law. He's, the bookies are going to have to go into something. Uh, they're able to trade freely there with Rafiki because he only has uh, his challenger. He has no uh, strength and, unless he's challenging. But the and two off there, game. and that's yeah. Game. yeah, it's enough. I think that goes to 20. Wow, that was that quite was a realized fantastic. Yet, but yeah, there we go. Yes, <laughs> that was a fantastic game. Both facing off uh, for this uh, chance to go into the semifinals. Of course, um, at being part of the top eight, as we mentioned, these players have earned um, not only an invite to the uh, the nationals, but also have earned that beautiful gold Mickey card. So, yeah. congrats again to these guys beautiful. for making it this far. Absolutely beautiful stuff. So, very much looking forward to. Um, uh, seeing how this goes. These two players are very well known in the community. Absolutely fantastic players, fan favorites for sure. Um, so this is going to be uh, a bit of sweet because obviously you both, you want to see the uh, the, the Locana community players do well, uh, but obviously there is only going to be one winner here. So it's going to be hopefully well thought out. Uh, yes. and we're, we're straight in. <laughs> we're, we're diving in. We've got Captain Hook down from Ryan. We have uh, the Cinderella singer there from Zam. Two, uh, two great decks here. As Amber Steel songs has just been, uh, you know, since the very beginning, one of the uh, one of the most exciting decks in the format. And then uh, Sapphire Steel also uh, just really pulling its weight. 
as well. How do you think the um, players are feeling about this matchup between uh, Sapphire Steel and Amber Steel? Uh, this is an interesting one because in, in some ways they're both trying to do very similar sort of things. They're just going to be gaining value from having stuff stick on the board whilst their uh, actions uh, deal with the opponents. So uh, Amber Steel is all about getting those singers down early in Amber and then moving into the Steel songs. Uh, Sapphire Steel is more about sort of taking control of the earlier game so as that you can come out with the uh, the big hitters later on and then probably finishing off with uh, with the Sapphire package of Tamatoa and Lucky Dime. Uh, we see a Fishbone Quill here, which is going to mean some uh, ramp is beginning from Ryan. We have a Smee down with the Captain Hook. Uh, just absolute fantastic quester here. Um, we uh, we may well see a Smee trade here from Zan. Um, mm. Sometimes it's, you just need to get theirs off the board uh, if yours isn't going to be as strong. Uh, but hopefully Cinderella gets to uh, sing something impressive at this point. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you think he's going to make that trade or do you think he's going to want to get on the board here? It's a tough call. I um, Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about this one because at the moment, uh, even though they're the same card, uh, Ryan's Smee is in a much better position than Zan's because of the, uh, just because of that hook there to the point where you can even see that the hook was uh, left ready there because his role now is mm -hmm. to keep that Smee uh, safe and to keep the uh, uh, the damage um, up there. Uh, the, other, oh, the other thing is as well is that... Um, uh, the two damage uh, steel wouldn't be able to finish him off because uh, of the hook there yes. as well. We see an aerial sensational singer, absolute poster child of the deck, uh, does yes. exactly what the deck wants to do. <laughs> Body comes down, looks at four cards, uh, is able to take a song from them and put it into your hand. And not only that, she's a three cost singer five as well. So she's able to sing up uh, into some of those bigger steel cards. So just grab your swords and a whole new world. That's most likely what Zan's going to be looking to do here at some point is to refuel his hand uh, with the whole new world being sang by something. Like yes, yep. Yeah, he does have four of those in his deck, Whole New World, so I'm sure we'll see it soon. Uh, I haven't seen his hand, so I'm not sure. What did he pull? World's Greatest Criminal Mind there? Mm -hmm, I um, think so. Uh, which is going to be it might might have been the only one that was there, but also yeah. uh, you know later on against some of the bigger steel problems might might be a might be a solid answer there. Uh, you know I think it's uh, it hits quite a few big things. It hits Tamatoa. Uh, if we're seeing. Um, if we're seeing Ryan play the Simba that's starting to see a little bit of play in this deck, the uh, the mm. Steel 5-7 uh, Simba that's starting to, uh, to creep into the meta a little bit later in the day, uh, that one is also a great target for uh, for uh, World's Great Criminal Mind as well. Uh, although it, just, uh, uh, it doesn't really matter because we whole new worlded, uh, so it's already gone. Yes, and it looks like uh, Zan got rid of the whole new world from Ryan's hand because he played that Bear Necessities. Yeah. So I, I'm sure Ryan was sad to see that go, and uh, Zan's right, right. now passed the turnover. Uh, but we did have that uh, Smee trade that I that I yes. thought might happen. Yeah, I think yep. uh, I think that's a good call there because, like I say, same card, uh, but on Ryan's board, just going to be doing a lot more work. Yeah, and and he did use Cinderella to sing Bear Necessities, so that leaves her open up to cap that Captain Hook for a challenge. Um, but, you know, Cinderella, I think that's okay. Yeah, she, she got the value there. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think so at this point. It uh, probably takes it. Uh, yeah. the, 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 you already have a better singer on the board now with Ariel, and she's uh, relatively safe this turn. So, yeah, I think that was a good play. And then also from Ryan here, we see the tragic hero, Beast. Just absolute fantastic card here on five. Just going to be refueling that hand back up, especially now uh, we lost the whole new world. Uh, it's, a, it's a great answer uh, to that and just being able to keep cards in your hand. Yeah, and it looks like Ryan might be empty-handed right now. Did he play everything? I think maybe so, yeah. So, yeah. And that's another play, knowing that your opponent is, is most likely looking to whole new world themselves as well, uh, getting as much value as possible out of that mm. happening is, is pretty good. And we just get an absolute ball wipe here. Uh, wow. Along came Zeus uh, taking out Tragic Beast and then Ariel um, challenging, something you don't see her do very often. Not often. But while, <laughs> that, uh, while that Captain Hook is sat there with one uh, health remaining, it's uh, definitely the uh, the right play, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I do typically see Ariel as a, she's your singer. And so to see her challenge into something like that is is really, you know, but it, he cleared his board and puts yeah. him at, in a really good spot, especially with that playing that along came Zeus to get rid of Beast. That was a really, really nice play there. I think uh, the big thing here is that Ryan's um, Zan's going to be looking at Ryan's hand. It was just one card that he didn't play. Um the whole new world yeah. is is not going to get as much of a tilt as you would like it to. Instead, we see a Benger, absolutely the answer to items in the current meta. Uh, Benger, just a fantastic body that comes down and just banishes an item from your opponent. 
just does a lot of work. Pretty much the only consistent item removal you see uh, in the game, honestly. As much as items are a problem, uh, he's really the only one that find, uh, consistently finds a slot. That You do see uh, Judy Hops come along in Sapphire sometimes, but uh, yeah, just a really solid card. Yeah. And, and with Ryan on Sapphire and really wanting to ramp up to some of these bigger cards, how do you think he's feeling with that yeah. fishbone quill being taken out? <laughs> yeah. So we see uh, Ryan seeing the uh, whole new world whole there. New world. Uh, just at some point, one of them's got to do it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, and it's going to be really uh, yeah, fueling whole back up again. New world. I'll sing oh, it. Beautiful. I'll sing it. <laughs> I can't resist. So we. Uh, uh, with a big yeah, tink that's ink. Um, oh, yeah, the, the big tink. Yeah, the big tink was ink, ink, ink. The tink. Exactly. Uh, so back over to Zen though. Obviously, the uh, the better board state. And a full hand of cards, and uh, five ink most likely will be six. So yeah, Ryan had to uh, refuel there with the whole new world, but it kind of felt great uh, with Zan both ahead on uh, on on board, and just now tempo with uh, we've been able to play things down. We see a Robin oh, Hood come Robin down. Robin Hood. Yeah, that's really nice. To, I mean, he really is at an advantage here with having uh, three characters on the board now. And Ryan, I'm sure, is feeling like he's got to get something down there to deal with with what Zan's been able to put out. Yeah, just like you say, just Zan having the the precision, just every time getting rid of the uh, the, the stuff needed to, and have the 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 deck. Uh, there's a lot of different ramp uh, ways to ramp in in Sapphire, but I feel like this deck is is running uh, quite a few less of them, and and really just focuses on that fishbone. So getting rid of that mm -hmm. fishbone uh, when he did was just was like real precision play. Uh, we see a, a fishbone come down and maybe go into ink. Ink, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this point, you know, we're at seven. Um, you know, you're able to play a lot of the bigger stuff you want. And there's that Simba I mentioned yeah. before. Uh, yeah, he's a seven-costed, inkable five-seven Dreamborn Hero Prince, and he has the ability that when he uh, when he comes into play, and then also when he challenges, you actually get to choose. He's a modal card, so he doesn't see play that often. You can tell because Zan's having to have a read <laughs> of it, but I, it ha I have noticed it come up in meta decks more recently. Uh, when he comes into play or when he challenges, you can either uh, draw two, discard two, um, which is basically ransack but on a body, uh, the card ransack, and then also, mm. uh, or you can deal two damage to a chosen character, which oftentimes is usually the one you go for. It's basically a free fire the cannons. It's actually uh, pretty strong, but sometimes just that digging through the deck for the answers is enough. But yeah, really interesting se uh, seven drop here, really interesting play, just a good body. That Again, modal cards very often see play because uh, having that options of different things you can do is really quite strong. Yeah, oh, and we see a Cinderella come down on Zan's side, which we've seen uh, from other players, and we know how strong that Cinderella can be, and especially with that Simba there, um, having that resist on such a, a large, you know, will-powered character is going to be really, really nice. Yeah, I, I just I sit there and say how good I think that seven drop Simba is, and then Zan plays the, <laughs> seven, the drop seven drop Cindy Cinderella and right absolutely laughs, uh, laughs in my coverage there <laughs> because yeah, she is uh, absolute fantastic five. Five, quest for three has resist two so it doesn't even take that two off uh, off of simba uh, and uh, and also uh, which will come up obviously with this being a still song deck she's able to challenge uh, steel uh, able to challenge ready characters when a song has been played so uh, yeah even if we uh, even if we don't turn that simba sideways here uh, if Zan's able to sing a song she'll be able to relatively cleanly take him out the seven uh, damage being enough to do him and then we'll only take three on the crackback because of that resist yeah. Now you just now saw Zan looking through Ryan's discard, which of course the discard is public knowledge, so players uh, can do that at any time. What do you think Zan is looking for? Uh, really just seeing how many of the things that we assume to be play sets in the deck have come through. So it's going to be things like how much of the Along Came Zeus's have I seen? How many of the um, Whole New Worlds have I seen? How many... Uh, um, you know, just things like that, really, just trying to think about how many answers are, are coming, uh, you know, what yeah. can I expect to come. Uh, that damage on uh, Cinderella shouldn't happen there because of the oh, resist yes. one. Uh, hopefully they'll uh, they'll catch that. Uh, this is uh, worth pointing out at this point that these games are recorded, so even if we do spot a slip like that, unfortunately there is not much we can do about it. Um, but yeah, the, yeah, the resist there require, uh, the triggers for all damage coming in, whether it's from challenge or from abilities mm -hmm. like that. So, uh, so yeah, Cinderella doesn't have a damage on her there, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, hopefully it's something they'll pick up on. 
Yeah, Cinderella has resist too, which is, uh, I mean, I think resist is one of the strongest abilities in, in Lorcana it, because it's each time uh, damage is done on oh, there, there they, they just caught it. Yep, they uh, just there's caught no, it. There's no way, no way neither of them wouldn't. Um, yeah. just, it just takes a moment to look at the board state and figure it out. So. Yeah, uh, there's so much going on in these players' heads right now, I can't even imagine. Uh, but yeah, that resist is in, so resist two on, on this 5-5 five, five character that Cinderella is, is just so strong. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think... What Zan would like to see here is a song so that Cinderella can yeah. start challenging into the ready uh, uh, ready characters, I think. Yeah. It doesn't look like he has a song in hand. I see a Robin Hood, and I got just a quick glimpse. But yeah, a song would be really great. I think those, if they're five drop on inkables, they must be songs. So they're either whole new worlds or grab your swords. I could just see the ink cost, so I'm not quite sure. There's a whole new world. I think oh, yeah. I also spied Sleepy's flute. He has a couple of whole new worlds, it looks like. So yeah. I, I wonder if he's thinking if that's if he wants to refill his hand here. Uh, it's uh, Multiple whole new worlds in the hand is never good because by playing one of them, you're getting rid of another one of them. Um, uh, so yeah, he has a long came Zeus. That, that's, that's a nice card. Yeah. So long came <laughs> Zeus is going to target the... Um, I think he can take out... Oh, no, he can't take out the Simba on its own. Simba is a 5-7. Um, so I think we might see here, I was going to put the damage on it. Yeah. And then challenge. And then Cinderella is going to go into the Tinkerbell, which she, she can mm -hmm. do. She can hit a ready card uh, because of the, um, uh, because of the, 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 the playing of the song there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I, I, again, with the thematic, you know, <laughs> that they've done with all these characters and their abilities. I, I, Cinderella, some of her other characters that you see in the game is a singer. I think there's a, a true drop that's a singer four, you know, so, and then yeah. the ballroom sensation, the one singer three. And then here we have this big Cinderella that comes in. And when you play a song, she can challenge ready characters. I just kind of love how they tie that together um, from one card to another card with the, with the same character. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm wondering uh, a little there why those two cards didn't go the other way around and the along came Zeus could have taken out the Tinkerbell and then Cinderella could have finished the the Simba in a challenge. Um, but I'm, you know, uh, I'm sure Zan's got his reasons. Do you, I, I wonder if it's just because they sees Tink as more of a threat because Tink, when she challenges, that she can put that additional damage on another character. And so he wanted to clear her off the board because of that. Yeah, they, they they both would have done though that way because the long came Zeus deals five damage, which is enough to put in Cabell. Um, and then the Cinderella being a seven seven could have gone into Simba. So uh, we see Cogsworth oh, come down Cogsworth. here. I think he's our, our first one of those that we've seen today. I think a couple of the uh, couple of the games on the floor saw this one, but it's definitely our first time commentating about him. He's a five costed Incable two five with two law. Uh, he can be shifted, although he doesn't really see the shift target any play. Uh, he has Ward and also gives other characters uh, that you control resist one. So a uh, real solid body that is very difficult to remove. Very very difficult to answer. Uh, he uh, does quest for two, but most likely will just sort of sit there and uh, provide uh, the resist. Um, and then Simba is able to uh, finish off the Cinderella there and then with the two other damage, take care of the other characters. The Benja. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Zan still has that Robin Hood on board though. So, uh, you know, he, he lost Cinderella, but I think he's feeling okay, right? How, how do you think he's feeling right now with this board state? Uh, yeah, it's it, it's really just a back and forth at this point. They're both mm -hmm. doing exactly what they need to do. They're answering cards when they need to. Uh, they're they're extending their board when they can. They're grabbing little bits of lore here and there. Uh, these decks, like I say, although they have very different ways of getting there, they kind of want to do the same sort of thing, which is control the uh, the early game and then uh, drop some uh, larger threats uh, yeah. later on. And, and when you're up against a deck that also wants to do that, uh, you can find that it you just sort of end up putting heads all the way through the game and you end up getting these very sort of slow incremental wins. Uh, the Sleepy's Flu is definitely going to help Zan there. We also see a whole new world. Um, yeah. So at the end of the day, he's losing one, but I do think that's a, a good play there just to refuel as you move further into the end game. Yeah, and I did see that uh, Ryan had a, a lucky dime and a whole new world himself that he had to discard there when uh, Zan played whole new world. Um, of course, he has more lucky dimes waiting, but I'm sure Zan's glad to see at least one of them go. And he did uh, draw a new whole new world over in Zan's hand. You can see Strength of Raging Fire, Bare Necessities is in there. I saw a Rapunzel as well. 
So a lot of answers then. Um, we yeah. can definitely, over the other side, we have another dime. Ah, another uh, dime. Another long came, another long came Zeus. I thought we were. Yeah, it looks uh, like we'd, it. We'd seen all of those there, perhaps. Oh, no, sorry. Last last game we saw all of them, excuse me. They're all starting to blend into one. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we see a better Cestes, which is great for us. We get to see a better version, a better look at the deck. Uh, so we have the Beast Hot-Headed. We have uh, Tragic Hero and Smee. And then on the other side, uh, we have the stuff you can actually take. Along came Zeus, a Pulpsicle, a Lucky Dime, and, and baboom. a Baboom, I think that last one is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so hard headed is an interest. Hard headed, excuse me, is an interesting one. He's basically a slightly bigger Benger. He's a five costed four four with two, law, and uh, will banish a uh, an item when it comes out. So most likely we'll want to see that come down to get rid of that flute. I feel. Uh, I suppose the bonus here is yes, it's a, a turn or two later than the Benger, uh, but it is a possible. Uh, well, no, that's you, you would play as a shift target for hit tragic hero. No, it's just a it's no. just a personal preference. Sometimes <laughs> I know a few people just prefer the uh, the hard headed beast over uh, over Benger. I personally prefer the Benger just be, just for fishbone quill. If nothing else, uh, it gets rid of that fishbone quill before it's done too much damage. So, yeah, it looks like Ryan is only running two of those beast hard headed and doesn't have any Benjas in his list. But we do mm -hmm. see the Benja um, over on Zan's side. We've we've obviously seen one or maybe even two, and that's all he has in his deck is just those two. All right, so Cogsworth not doing much. On his own here, giving other stuff resists, but when there's no other stuff, uh, you know, he'll he'll just sit there and, and just make your board a little stronger. So hopefully uh, for Ryan, he'll be able to get some more bodies down. And we'll probably see a popsicle play here just to uh, have a little bit more uh, information. Always, if you're able to draw cards, always do them as early as you can into the turn because the more cards in your hand, the more information you've got, the more answers you have. Uh, always try and draw uh, before anything else, for the most part, there's a couple of times where you wouldn't want to, but for the most part, you want to be looking at cards uh, before you decide what to do. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Yeah, you want as many options as you have to make the best decisions that you can with what's going on is the the best thing to do. And it looks like he did bring that hard, hard headed, hard headed beast. <laughs> I was going to yeah. say hard headed, hard headed beast down to <laughs> take care of Sleepy's flute. <laughs> yeah. He is probably a little bit of a hot head, you know that beast. Uh, uh, we see uh, a lot of resources going into the Venger here, both uh, Cogsworth and um, and, uh, and a Baboom and a Porpsicle to heal the Cogsworth back up again. So, uh, yeah, really didn't want that Venger to stick around. Yeah. Uh, at this point, though, Zan is, you know, at 11 law, sorry. So, you know, that, 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 that quest for two on Venger is, is a little bit more threatening than we perhaps think. Yeah, it, it does look, I thought I saw Hiram uh, Flowersham in Ryan's hand, which of course he he needs uh, some items out there to banish in order to get the card draw, but he used that popsicle to heal Cogsworth. So what are your thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, it's not something you see very often, to be honest with you. Popsicle, uh, for the most part, comes out on one, replaces itself, and then gets uh, chewed up by Hiram. Uh, <laughs> pretty mm -hmm. much the, 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 the optimal line there for Popsicle, but sometimes you do forget that it does have a second ability where you can can banish it to its own ability uh, to heal to, uh, which we're seeing Zandu here with a Rapunzel healing up the Robin Hood uh, and refueling yes. his hand. Uh, Rapunzel allows you to heal up to three damage uh, from a character, and then for each damage that you heal, you get to draw a card. Really fantastic card. Uh, seen consistent play through in set, uh, since set one. Uh, not as much now, but um, but but definitely still one of the uh, one of the strongest amber cards. I feel no, absolutely. And uh, it looks like Zan has a few different songs that he could play here if he wanted to. Oh. Uh, Ryan's taking a look through uh, Zan's uh, discard. Again, just sort of looking for tallies of play sets. What's gone? Yeah, I feel like at these, um, you know, when you have these longer matches that go back and forth and back and forth, that... Um, Knowing, you know, how, you know, like how many whole new worlds and long came Zeus, like you said, knowing how many have been played is really just going to help you make the best decisions possible, knowing what might still be coming. Yeah. So we see Rapunzel and Robin Hood and a second Robin Hood there, kind of a, a aggressive board uh, from Zan. Ryan with the uh, the Beast and the Cogsworth, definitely wanting to be uh, uh, trying to quest and, and sort of close that lore gap. He's got a lot of ink, got a lot of cards in hand, both players a lot of ink and a lot of cards in hand. So really wanting to be sort of to, uh, Ryan's going to be wanting to close out the, uh, the the gap here. We see a big Tamatoa come oh, down. Tamatoa. He's able to go and grab an item back and then 
uh, replay it with that lasting. So that may, uh, goes again. Oh, sorry, let me just get my words together. <laughs> I'm getting all excited. <laughs> um, explains a little bit why the pubs are called got, uh, Pop to heal up the Cogsworth there because yeah. he knew full well that Tamatoa was going to be able to get it back. And it looks like that's what we'll see again next turn. Tamatoa not only brings an item back from the discard on play, also does it on quest as well. Uh, we see a tragic hero go into the Inkwell too. Now, interesting here with uh, Ryan's deck is he actually only runs one copy of Tamatoa in ah. his deck. So it, it really is that uh, kind of silver bullet, I suppose, you know, um, coming into play here. And he happened to get it in this game. And, and I think it's going to do him some good. Yes, I think so. Yeah, so it's not necessarily the big uh, the big closeout. I think the uh, the big closeouts here are just just the bigger steel characters being able to comfortably quest which was seen here with uh, cogsworth and uh, oh, the beast went into uh, the robin hood so uh, but yeah tamato are on the board if we can get an item or two to stick uh, it's going to be a, a tricky problem for zan to deal with i i know we talked about uh, world's greatest criminal mind before Mm. Was that because it was in discard, or I'm assuming it's been wheeled away by now with the, uh, with the whole new world? <laughs> yeah, it's in his discard. He did. Um, he got that when he played his Aero Spectacular Singer earlier in the game, but uh, because yeah. of that whole new world, it went into his discard. But that would definitely come in handy right now. He doesn't yeah. have a good answer for Tomatoa. Tomatoa has eight willpower. Yeah, um, so he's huge guy. Yeah, he's gonna need a, a couple things to take care of that that crab. Uh, let the storm rage on finishes off beast there now cogsworth is removed uh, beast no longer has the one resist we see another flute come down uh, and just start to and then rapunzel questing as well uh, definitely closing this game out now tamatoa is an amazing card uh, but without much else on the board he's you know he's only questing for one i i feel like we uh, we really need to see Ryan pull out a couple of uh, uh, characters to to sort of contest the board and an item or two so that Tamatoa gets turned on. Uh, we see a queen come down as well, which is going to make um, Robin Hood's uh, trades a lot better. Oh, the lore is updated at that point. Sorry, I thought we were a little bit further away. So, uh, yeah, at this yeah. point, I think it's probably game two. Uh, Ryan needs Zan's to really game. pull out an answer here. Um, but obviously, you know, very, no time limit. Uh, well worth taking a moment just to think about all of your different outs, think about all of your different options, uh, playing for it to see what happens. Uh, Tamato is going to bring back a Popsicle, I imagine. That Popsicle will get played to draw a card. Again, just seeing as much information as you can. Um, you know, but, but at this point, I, I think it's probably game one to Zan. Four puts down a Hiram, which pops the Popsicle, gets to see two more. Uh, so all of these, you know, digging for answers, but all of these these plays cost uh, ink as well. So the more I you think go, he knows. yeah, yep. there you go. The more you go, the less you're going to do with the with the leftover ink that yeah. you've got. Uh, did exactly what being you altered here, knowing what's coming. What are they looking for in that opening hand? So I imagine Ryan's going to be wanting to get rid of Zan's early singers. So Ryan's mm. going to be looking for removal for Cinderella. Um, and then uh, maybe a little bit later, Ariel. Also, some of the uh, the, the Floodborne targets of Robin Hood and Queen. So I think that's uh, pretty solid there. Zan, I, in, to some extent, the similar kind of thing, but also going to be looking uh, for that item removal to shut down the Fishbone on turn three. I do see Avenger in hand um, and a, a Robin Hood here. So we'll see whether Ryan has an answer to it. And then, yeah, Zan's going to definitely be looking to get rid of that Fishbone Quill as soon as he can. Yeah, Zan does have a whole new world there waiting, so uh, I'm sure that's going to be becoming. And if he can draw a narrow spectacular singer soon, that'll be real nice for him. Mm -hmm. You see, Mr. Smee come down from uh, from Ryan got a got a good bit of value out of him in game one, uh, but didn't really stick around much. Uh, yeah, Zan as playing Steel Song, absolutely. You you want to be uh, getting whole new worlds played as quick as you can uh, whether that's through uh, the aerial singer or uh, your shift uh, shifted five drops singing it so you know pretty much all of the uh, the shift targets in the deck the robin hood champion of sherwood the queen commanding presence uh, all can sing it uh, and really get that uh, get that the, uh, the, the the card draw started uh, and you know you're yes you're fueling both of your hands but you're doing it because you want to do it uh, they're doing it because you're making them. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, interesting here, we didn't see Ryan quest with Smee, and he did put down those Captain Hooks, so Smee would not have taken damage since there was a Captain in play. Uh, what do you think he was thinking there? 
Uh, he just has to respect that Robin Hood. Uh, just He's has sure. to know that the uh, <laughs> the champion of Sherwood come come down. It doesn't look like it's in Zan's hand, but uh, again, I'll say this: you always have to play as if your yes. opponent has the exact answer. You all, <laughs> you always yes. have to play. Occasionally, you can throw enough on the board down and be like, "Ah, you be prepared, or you haven't." Um, but uh, but yeah, you always have to kind of respect what those uh, smaller characters that look very unassuming. There it is. Uh, There's I, that I, shift. I, I, I was I didn't think it was in the hand, but it was. Um, he just drew it. Yeah, he he actually only has that Benja and Rapunzel in hand as far as characters yeah. go, and then some songs. But on the play, on his turn, he drew that Robin drew Hood, it. which so, yeah, I'm so, sure he was real happy to see. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right play from Ryan there to to keep the Smee up. Uh, yeah, so at the, at, at, right now he can. He's in a good position. He can take a turn off and 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 sort of really just build that board state out. Yeah, and I can't see what else Ryan has in his hand. Um, but he doesn't have a lot of bigger bodies besides you know Smee is that three three. But I'm sure he's is sitting at four. Um, ink that he's looking for some of the bigger characters to be able to play soon. Yeah, a high room would be really good here, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, get that popsicle pops and start refueling your hand at this point. Uh, we see a whole new Cogsworth. world, Cogsworth, and uh, I think uh, a long fame Zeus. And Tell, talk about the strategy here with Whole New World because it does seem um, sometimes like you're giving your opponent an advantage by giving them new cards, which we do see him playing there with uh, using Robin Hood to sing A Whole New World. Yeah, um, there is definitely a risk uh, risk versus reward with Whole New World. You're, you, like you said, you're fueling your hand back up again, but you're letting your opponent do the same. And uh, usually more often than not, you're... Uh, your whole new world is then passed to an opponent with ink ready. So you, you, you're you definitely giving them a little bit of advantage there. Uh, but the reason you want to do it is your whole deck is built around going through and finding those uh, key pieces earlier. And there's having that uh, sort of tempo shift of doing it on your terms. You know, the, the whole new world is being played when you want to play it. Uh, we'll see yes. here that the Rapunzel came down with nothing to heal just to get that body on the board, get her out of the hand before the whole new world comes down. And uh, Ryan yeah. didn't have that uh didn't have that opportunity right it was it just got rid of the cards that was in his hand cogsworth probably would have been a nice play for him here he now doesn't have it he also gets rid of his whole uh, his his own whole new world uh, yes. but in doing so uh zani is also giving ryan a full hand of cards to uh, to play with so uh yeah it's definitely a risk versus reward uh, strategy yeah. Oh, well, and like you said, uh, you know, with uh, being able to control, you have the decide. You're just des you decide when it happens instead of having it happen to you. You're yeah. deciding when you get that new hand. So we see a Mickey come down to build of uh, that inkwell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mickey lets you put a uh, detective Mickey. That is sorry, yeah. lets you put a card into the inkwell exerted when he comes down. So it's ramp, uh, not the quickest ramp in the game, but definitely uh, you know still a perfectly sensible way to ramp cards up. We see a baboon getting, and then we see the double uh, Captain Hook going into the Robin Hood. There, really great play. I think mm -hmm. uh, definitely worth holding um, holding them back uh, for that. Uh, you know, even holding the Smee back before as well. You know, so that the Robin Hood couldn't go in and get healed yeah. by the Rapunzel. Just really, really great plays from both of them here they, know, they seem to know exactly what they're doing yeah that mickey mouse um detective has been around since set one mm -hmm. is that a, a card that we are i mean we see it now in ryan's deck do we see it often in uh sapphire decks that mickey yeah. mouse card there, there's definitely still a spot for it. It, it i feel like personally it's been a little bit outpaced by things like pop uh by things like uh fishbone quill mm -hmm. um but you know there's still something to be said about a body coming down and, and providing ramp and then sticking around as well um yeah there we see Looks another like Smee come down here. That's interesting. Sing, we're going to sing Let the Storm Rage On with Rapunzel. And of course, he gets to draw off of that as well. I love any song or action that you can play where you you can replace it by drawing a card. It's really nice. Absolutely, yeah. We're just going to um, turn the value off the songs here, replacing themselves. The, the, the flute is online now at this point as well. So, yeah. Yeah, this was really, really... Uh, these two decks are very evenly matched to very skilled players. Uh, both of them are sitting now at just two lore. And it's, I feel like it's going to just be a lot of back and forth again, like we saw last game. Very close. Absolutely. Just going to be edging out board presence when they can, edging out lore game when they can, um, just doing exactly what they need to do. Very, uh, very exciting stuff, especially with, um, uh, like you said, two, two real sort of pro players, really, both fantastic players and great personalities as well both really mm -hmm. sort of uh, appreciated in the community so uh, really great to see them here sort of thrashing it out 
Yeah, I, I do spy a Cinderella stout hearted over in Zan's hand. We're a couple turns away because that it costs seven to bring her down and he only has five in his ink well. But um, if we don't see another whole new world before we get there, I'm sure he will be playing that. Absolutely, yeah. We're going to yes. do three damage over there on Rapunzel, it looks like, with the Smee. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had another know. Rapunzel who could come and heal it, yeah, no, no, well, I, boom. I was just <laughs> going to say, cannons. there's no way Ryan leaves something uh, un, uh, half healed <laughs> on, uh, on Zan's ball at this point. So I, I was going to suggest it was a baboom, but instead it was a fire the cannons, again, just to finish her off there. Um, yeah, I think that's an absolutely fair play at that point to get her off the board, but never never leave something damaged onto a Steel, uh, steel Song player's board. <laughs> Fire the cannons. I haven't seen a lot of that today, uh, but that's just a, a one cost uninkable action to deal two damage to chosen character. Just a simple, uh, you can play it at any point in the game. It's a real fun card. Yeah, um, I, a lot of play, a lot of players are, are running Baboom over it now, which is a two cost, but it is inkable and it does two damage to a character or location. Um, so you, sometimes it's it's the extra you need to finish off the castle. Um, but yeah, there's something to be said about just a one drop that deals two. Uh, yes. you know, just just as the baseline for for what this game uh, allows you to do. Yeah, so um, Ryan has one of each in his deck, and that's it. So one Fire the Cannons, uh, one Baboom, and he happened to have that Fire the Cannons at just the right moment. Here. Yeah, exactly. It just it, uh, They're basically in there to help a trade like that happen, I'm pretty yes. sure. They're, they're just there to just finish off something that uh, something else is sort of trading up into, which is what we saw with the Smee there. Uh, we're going to have Robin Hood sing. Uh, then along came Zeus to take out the beast. A great target for that. Mm -hmm. We don't want to see uh, Ryan drawing cards if we're Zan. He uh, does have another some... Sleepy's Flute there. Is that something you think he wants to get on the board so for that additional lore gain? Um, yeah, I mean, always, you know, flutes are just going to help you close out the game. Um, but obviously at this point as well, you're also going to be looking for board presence. Uh, Ryan hasn't got much going on here with the, with the, uh, the Smee that's got two damage on him and the, and the Mini Mouse, uh, Mickey Mouse. So you might be able to take a turn off here to get the flute down, which is what Zan does. Uh, and he still has three ink to play with, so most likely can still get something like a Smee down. I see a couple of them there. Um, we uh, we ink a Robin Hood, which gives us four. So we might just see, yeah, there we go. We see double Smee, which is yep. which is kind of kind of awesome. <laughs> that is kind uh, of awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a really solid turn. So two two uh, two flutes uh, turning sideways there. I think the the law might be a little off. I think I think we we're a little higher for Zam. So. Um, the Robin Hood went into the champion, the big Robin Hood went into his inkwell. Of course, Robin Hood only quests for two, and so he's put down two Smees that both quest for two. So feeling like that was a, a good decision there, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The board presence from the, from yep. the Smees is, is kind of huge. Uh, and just knowing that uh, Ryan's uh, removal package is very similar to, to, to his own and knows that more bodies just mean that those uh, single target steel removals are just going to be doing less. Uh, we just see a giant tink come down there doing one to all of them, uh, which is going to uh, speed up Smee's demise if we, uh, if we don't see a captain, which I don't think we mm. will in... Um, in, in Amber Steel for Zan's deck doesn't play the uh, the one drop captain hook. I, I do know that um, that some players play Piglet, uh, the Amber captain. Uh, the ah Pirates, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, which I think is quite a good pairing with Mr. Smee. Mr. Smee doesn't mind where his captains come from. He just needs exactly. one. Exactly. Uh, he just needs a captain. <laughs> he's happy to get in line behind uh, behind. Uh, <laughs> Uh, poo, yes. uh, behind Piglet. <laughs> yes, yes. Smee is a follower, not a leader. Yeah, so absolutely. any captain will do. <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan does have, a, looks like a Hiram in hand, which I would expect to come down soon, especially with all those popsicles over there and yeah. to get some more cards in hand. And yeah, he is questing with Smee. Definitely wants to be uh, refueling at some point, but I do think the, the, the big thing was the good play there, just to start to put the pressure on against these uh, uh, Robin Hoods. Robin Hoods wants to trade. That one damage might be enough to uh, make Zan have to rethink it. Those Smees are going to be taking damage at the end of turn if they quest, so the one damage there is just speeding up uh, how long they're going to be on the board for. So, yeah, I think the big thing was a really great line there for, for Ryan. Yeah, Big Tink is so fun, and her art is amazing. It's she's came out in set one in the first chapter, and has been like a fan favorite. I think <laughs> ever since uh, she made her appearance, so much so that the playmat for this newest set, Ursula's Return features the art from that card and it's beautiful i remember first when i first saw that card revealed uh it kind of made me really sit up and notice look on i'd obviously been covering ah. it since it was very first announced uh just as a big disney fan and a, and, a, and a big card game player but uh giant 
fairy was the one that made me sit up and be like, oh, wow, not only is the art incredible and really something that we hadn't seen before, I don't feel, um, just the, the abilities on her, the amount that she does, the stats on her, when I obviously, you know, been caught up now with lots of other really great cards, but at the time, uh, you know, she really sort of uh, blew the box open as to what was possible with Lorcana. So I, I, I very fond memories of, uh, of Giant Tink being revealed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, she's definitely a favorite. She's so fun. And the alternate art with on the Enchanted is also super fun. Yeah. Uh, all the art in this game it is amazing. And I think for folks out there who are huge Disney fans, oh, and we see Ariel digging for some cards, and he does find a whole new world there for mm -hmm. Zan. Um, you know, I think it does, the art catches a lot of attention of, of Disney fans because it's characters that we know and love and being drawn in these new wonderful ways. And it also helps remember the characters more for me, you yeah. know, because they're 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 characters I'm familiar with. So I remember Giant Tink and Robin Hood and Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, we see Robin Hood going into um, Mickey Mouse Detective there, like really sort of. I don't say obvious, but like very clean line there. Mickey Mouse sure. is not putting up much of a threat for Robin Hood there. Just takes uh, one damage on the uh, on the challenge there. We see a Rapunzel come down, instantly healing it and drawing uh, some. And we are trading into that SME. Smart there. Yeah. And then, yeah, just just real great turn from Zan there. Just absolute board control, doing everything he needed to do, drew cards, uh, cleared the board up a little bit, developed his, uh, his own lore as well. Yeah, just real great play there. Yeah, I and mean, he is questing for two with that last me who does take one additional damage because there's no captain in play. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going over now to Ryan. So it does feel like Ryan needs to find some answers here. He's got a Hiram, Flavorsham, and is it a Lucky Dime? And he just drew something else. But um, what do you think he's hoping to do? Get some yeah, board think, presence back? Oh, oh yeah, look at, definitely looking for answers with the, with the Hiram here mm -hmm. is definitely the play, just sort of getting... Uh, some card advantage in your hand. Uh, the, the Mickey there, I don't think he's going to be doing much. Yeah, the Fishbone, Fishbone Quill, Quill isn't really going to be doing much at this point in the game. You know, we're getting up to the levels, you know, to the point where we're actually inking it there, you see, because we're getting up to the ink levels that they kind of want to be happy with. Uh, Cogsworth is actually pretty solid here. Um, Tinkerbell is very happy trading <laughs> uh, with stuff that, uh, that Cogsworth is going to help her do that. I think we probably see... Um, do we see Tink maybe go into? Do you uh, think Robin Hood? Hood? Yeah, so Robin Hood is six there's no, willpower. There's no damage on uh, on Robin Hood. So it's not quite enough, unfortunately. Not quite enough. Um, yeah. So and the and the two damage that she does does have to go uh, to a uh, different character. Uh, yeah. Well, she it only happens on Banish, so it, on she Banish. can't she can't challenge into Robin Hood and then use the two to finish him off. Unfortunately, uh, yeah. she can go into Smee and put two onto Robin to start that process. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a difficult line at the moment. There's not really a great target for her. And he's Let's thinking he about it. Yes, he so is going to go into Smee. And then putting the two on the Robin Hood. That means, you know, next turn, now Robin Hood going into uh, Tinkerbell uh, is, uh, is pretty good. We pop the popsicle to heal her up as well. So now she's at full health and there's a Cogsworth out giving her resist one. Uh, yeah, it's a, really, it's a good choice, I think. That's, that's probably what I'd have gone for as well. Yeah. It, it amazes me, the, these players, you know, playing at this level and just what they can see and thinking ahead, you know, a couple turns and seeing all these lines of play and knowing what's coming and how they're able to just, uh, you know, make things switch so quickly. You know, it looks like they're in trouble and then they just do something amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to see, I mean, both both players here really, really playing their hearts out and, and yeah. with, with kind of clunky hands at this point as well. You know, we've seen a lot of like double whole new worlds in hands mm -hmm. with, uh, with uh, Ryan there with with the ramp that he wanted to see much earlier in the game now. It's, Cinderella it, now coming down. Uh, there yeah. she is. Her heart is <laughs> absolutely huge. Uh, she is a seven cost. Uh, but wow, she's uh, she's going to be starting to do a lot now. Five five again. We resist two. Quest for three, and can challenge uh, ready characters. So we have a dime and a Mickey on uh, yeah. Ryan's side. I mean, the dime. Not what he wants. No, yeah. doesn't have a great target. You know, Tinkerbell or Cogsworth both questing for two. Uh, we see a grab your sword come down. Uh, that'll just be one for the Hiram and the Tinkerbell uh, due to Cogsworth resist. Um, 
but again it's just going to help the uh help the trades if he decides on it instead he's going to quest really start putting some pressure on i think that's definitely the right play here from zan i think he's going to want to try yeah. and close this game out pretty quickly then it does feel like we're just a, maybe a turn or two away from zan taking this uh ryan does not have the hand right now that he needs we'll see if he can draw something but let's see what he's got yeah lot is a little behind here i think mm -hmm. and he's on uh uh, tw uh, 12, I think. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Lines, well, and yeah. he also had the he also had the flutes as oh, well. Oh, flutes as well. Flutes. So we might, yeah, we might even be on 14. He might then. be on 14. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he might he might have um have the win on board unless Ryan can find the answer here. That Cinderella really, really made a big difference here. You could tell it just, <laughs> it shifted body, things. Very difficult to deal with. <laughs> And yeah, uh, yeah and, and quest for three. Just again, all these big steel, uh, you know, end game plays. Just they can they do everything. They do it all. They 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 yes. quest well. They challenge well. <laughs> yes. Uh, they just tick all the boxes. Yeah. So he's at. So yeah. So they've updated the lore counter. So Zan's at fourteen now. Ryan's mm -hmm. at six, and he's got that Mickey and dime and something else I can't quite see in his hand, and mm -hmm. he's shaking his head. I think he's. Yeah. I I uh, I mean I I really I can't think at all here what what ryan can have but like i said before these games aren't timed at this point uh you should always just you know play as much as you can see as much as you can dying comes down i i i think we're probably just going to quest uh uh for one to pop the dime just to see something which is yeah. uh, which is kind of crazy so the the dime just cost two to exert uh, but yeah, mm, he's showing his yes. hand and saying, good uh, game, my hand is bricked, uh, you absolutely yes. take that one. So there we go, Zan in two, a great player. I mean, both really fantastic players there, but... All right, so Joshua being the higher seed, it looks like he is going to be able to go first. And already we see a very interesting card. We see a fairy godmother being inked. I don't think I've seen that being played in an Amethyst Ruby deck before, to be honest. That is uh, way, way outside of what I'm used to, uh, to be honest with you. Looks like we're playing in, oh, I'm sorry, in, uh, an Amethyst Amber deck is what it looks like we're playing, uh, that Joshua is playing. This could be a little bit tricky for Albert, to be honest with you. Um, Ruby Amethyst usually struggles into a really aggressive Amber Amethyst final deck because they uh, just come out of the gate swinging. They usually play some really aggressive characters and uh, Ruby Amethyst usually doesn't have a way to interact with those characters while they're readied. Um, Ruby Amethyst struggles a little bit in the beginning. You can, mainly because an Amber Amethyst player can play a pretty wide board. And a lot of times the Ruby Amethyst player are playing bounce cards on turn two, like uh, Madame M Snake and Madame M Fox. And so it makes it a little bit difficult to deal with these wide boards when you're playing so narrow as Ruby Amethyst. Absolutely. What, what an interesting deck. I'm taking a moment to kind of soak this in, looking at the cards he's playing. You know, typically uh, the Amethyst Amber decks, the ones we usually see are hyper aggressive. They're they're very, um, they try to build that Lord lead super early. Uh, but in this deck, we see um, uh, Mufasa's um, Fairy Godmother, some interesting cards. So I'm excited to see what Joshua's game plan here is and how this is going to play out. Yeah, it's really honestly so exciting to see such an unconventional deck all the way up here in top four. I mean, if you would have asked me what deck I expected to be in top four, Amber Amethyst would not be one of them. And this is the second time that we see that Fairy Godmother. Liam, why don't you tell us what this Fairy Godmother does? Yeah, Fairy Godmother is a three cost, three, four with one lore. And her ability is leave it to me. Whenever you play a character named Cinderella, you may exert chosen character. So this is a card, uh, you know, if Cinderella's are available, that you can use to exert your opponent's characters. But at this point, um, it's not not able to. Yeah, I don't know. It's we haven't seen this card yet. No, kind of, no, I'm, I'm very kind of trying to figure it out right to now. See this? The only uh, Cinderella card that I can think of off the top of my head in either Amethyst or Amber is the single Cinderella one cost singer card. Um, but, right. But even then, she's only singer three. You're not really working in inks that play a ton of phenomenal songs in there, to be honest with you. 
We do see this shift, Fairy Godmother, though, and I think that one is going to be um, something to look out for because she can be a really strong card once on board. She can shift for two. Uh, she's an inkable five cost, three, four with two lore, and she has an ability that says whenever this character quests, your characters get challenger plus three, and when this character is banished in a challenge, return this card to your hand this turn. So essentially when Fairy Godmother enters play, um, you're looking to shift Fairy Godmother so that you can quest that turn, giving the rest of your characters challenger plus three, meaning they'll be able to challenge for with an extra three strength. And then when they are banished in that challenge, instead of going to the discard pile, they come back to your hand, which is a really interesting take on uh, what is typically a really aggressive ink combo with Amber Amethyst, where you're playing a bunch of small characters, trying to quest as fast as you can. Uh, instead, Joshua is but taking... this is why. This is the payoff for this card. Yeah, exactly. You see the Mufasa, and this is where we see a combo forming. Liam, why don't you take it and tell us what might be happening? No, played at the perfect time. I, we we're right about to go into this. I mean, you can see what you were setting up here with the Mufasa. Mufasa is a card it's a 3-3 three, three, the quest for two, but when it's banished in a challenge, um, you can look at the top card of your deck, and if it's a character card, you can put it into play for free, essentially replacing the Mufasa. But if that card's been given challenger and the ability from Fairy Godmother, um, then it's banished into challenge, it goes back to your hand, and you get the card off the top of your deck, allowing you to then play the Mufasa again, and you can do some really interesting things. Yeah, I've never really seen this recycling of Mufasa. It's a very efficient way to get characters in onto the board, which I really like. I mean, this is so unique. I'm excited to be seeing this here at such a far point in the tournament here all the way in the top eight. Who would have expected this? You have Ruby Amethyst, arguably uh, the least exciting deck. It's the one that we've seen since set one just take over the meta of set two and still be relevant here in set three versus a deck that I haven't seen anybody play before. No, nope. We've seen a lot of red fossas. We haven't seen a lot of purple fossas, so i um, excited to see how this plays out. Uh, another interesting note, you know, you have cards in, uh, in uh, Amethyst, that, like the goat, that, that gain you something when they enter and leave play. So um, Fairy Godmother's ability working with a goat or with a rabbit or anything like that also allows you to, to get more value out of those cards. Um, if they're returned to your hand, uh, being banished in a challenge, you can play them again. Yeah, one of the things that we noticed, there was a single Amber Ruby Mufasa deck that made it into the top 64. And when we were watching that game, we mentioned how in those Mufasa lists, card draw is really an issue. It's difficult if you don't open them with the Mother Gothel and the Rapunzel to draw three cards and refill your hand, you can really struggle. But when you take out Ruby and you put in Amethyst, you gain this mid-range package of really valuable cards that create a ton of value with cards like Merlin Rabbit and Goat, like Liam just said, cards that you want to see bounce back and forth from your hand and onto the uh, board. And usually that's done through cards like Madam M. Fox and Madam M. Snake, which we still see some of in Joshua's deck, but he's also potentially going to be able to use the Fairy Godmother to add to that as well. No, that's absolutely right. Talking about the, you're right about the, the limited card draw and, and getting that mid-range card draw out of it. But the, the Fairy Godmother is another way that allows you to do, it allows you to do more with a few cards that you have. If you can play a card, you know, two or three times uh, leveraging Fairy Godmother then and get more value out of that card, maybe the card draw is less of a problem. I also see a Perdita in Joshua's hand that he was fl flipping around with. And Perdita is also a pretty interesting Amber card. When it is played and when it quests, you get to bring back a character that costs two or less from your discard uh, or no i think you get to i think it just gets to be played i can't quite remember it's one of those two you either get to play it or bring it back to your hand either way a really strong ability being able to bring cards back from discard reuse them over and over again and we see joshua uh his it's paying off the stack's paying off for him he's already at eight lore with alberto at three alberto has been basically having to respond to everything that Joshua's been playing because he's been playing uh, a bit of an aggressive opening, just gaining lore where he can, playing characters that uh, are really valuable, things like Pascal that keep evasive, uh, Merlin, uh, sorry, Merlin Rabbit that draws you cards. We still have the Mufasa on board. We have another Mufasa in hand, and when the Mufasa gets banished or uh, leaves play, we'll be able to potentially play another card from the top of Joshua's deck as well. And here we see the Perdita doing that bringing back Cusco from the discard into play. Cusco being a card that when banished gets you to draw a card. Uh, and that Cusco, I imagine, won't be the last time that we see him coming into play to help Joshua keep 
uh, his handful. No, absolutely not. It's the perfect uh, two cost or less character to pull back from your discard pile with Perdita there, because um, again, giving you that card draw. Um, I, I, it's really interesting watching what this deck's doing so far. One note on Mufasa, one thing that a lot of these uh, Mufasa roulette decks like to do is work in a few big characters um, to give you a really big payoff, and we see a Shurnabog there uh, in Joshua's hand. We can assume that there's more than one in this deck, so that Mufasa, when it leaves play, could put something quite large into play. And Brandon, there's the Cinderella. Yeah, so it looks like Joshua is playing the Cinderellas. After we saw the shift Fairy Godmother, I thought maybe the other Fairy Godmother was only in there as a shift target for the Floodborne Fairy Godmother, but it looks like that's not true. It looks like Joshua actually is playing Cinderella, and I can kind of understand it. There aren't a plethora of uh, three-cost or lower songs in Amber and Amethyst that usually see play, but you still have cards like Friends on the other side that you could potentially sing with Cinderella on turn two. And it looks like that's going to wrap up the game one. Uh, and Joshua just sort of took that one over. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I do want to talk about that Cinderella combo again, though, because I, I think you're right earlier, because these Mufasa decks don't want to run a lot of songs at all, because that Mufasa is really dependent on hitting a character on the top deck. And so um, I think... Uh, one of the reasons that Cinderella is in there, obviously, is for the Fairy Godmother, but it pairs really well with Perdita. These colors do not have a lot of removal. Um, there's not a lot of damage, or there's not a lot of cards that remove your opponent's characters from the board. So what it's relying on are cards that it can, can exert your opponent's characters to make them targets for your challenges. Um, and that's what... Um, Cinderella can do when paired with that fairy godmother. But when Perdita can pull Cinderella back from the discard pile over and over again, it makes it easy to reuse. So there's just a ton of cards here which are allowing you to, to, to replace themselves or get maximum value out of, out of the cards in this deck. Yeah, I love the Perdita engine that lets you bring those cards back. And man, so I was wrong. I didn't see the be prepared that Albert had played. The game's not over, uh, but there were enough characters in the discard for Joshua to be able to drop this absolute bomb, Chernabog, a 9-9, I believe, with three lore. Now, Chernabog is discounted. His cost is discounted for every character card in your discard pile. So it makes it really efficient for you to be able to play him. And then when you do play him, you have to shuffle all of your characters character cards back into your deck. So I'm starting to see a theme here in Joshua's deck where you're using Mufasa to get cards out onto the board, using Perdita to bring back valuable cards from your discard. Uh, you're using the characters in your discard to use the Trenabog, and you're using Fairy Godmother to make the most efficient, or to make the characters as efficient as you can on board by challenging other characters and bringing them back to your hand so that you can replay them also. Absolutely. We did see the, the Fairy Godmother Cinderella combo go off there, and, but uh, to, to little effect because uh, Rafiki was unexerted immediately. Yeah, and Joshua is putting Albert in a, a yeah, in a be prepared or buzz situation. It looks like Albert has the be prepared to get rid of it again. Joshua being at 15 lore and Albert at 8. Albert is just trying his best to uh, keep Joshua from winning, honestly, keep Joshua from putting too many characters on board. But here we see it again, the Perdita come out, dragging another two cost or less character, in this case Cinderella, back onto the board. Albert just got rid of all those characters, and here's Perdita bringing them right back. Bringing him right back from the discard pile. Um, over on Albert's side, unfortunately, not a lot of cards in hand. Uh, he's had to use a lot of his answers already, and, and not a lot of card draw available. So um, he's looking for things to deal with this, but uh, with 15 lore, um, every single lore now on Joshua's side of the board matters, and so he's going to have to consistently find the cards he needs to prevent questing. Here we have a Queen's Castle come on the board. This is a uh, four-cost card with two lore. Um, it has an ability uh, for every character that you put there. You get to draw an extra card at the start of your turn, but in this instance, uh, nothing to put there, but it will give him lore at the start of each one of his turns, unless Joshua wants to remove it. Yeah, I really don't like this uh, Queen's Castle from Albert, to be honest from you. Not for any reason other than it's just a really slow play because it's not getting rid of any of the characters on Joshua's board. He's already at 18 lore. He has the Perdita where he can bring back another character. In this case, he brings back Madame M. Snake to bounce the Cinderella back to hand after questing with her. And it's unless Albert has a way to banish everything on board, uh, he's not going to have this game. Mufasa would even bring another character on board, even if he were able to get rid of the Mufasa. Fasa also. And it looks like Joshua has the goat in hand anyway, being at 18 lore. So that is going to be game one going to Joshua. And I'll
So I'm wondering what Albert is even thinking of here. That, like I've said, like we said earlier, Joshua is playing a deck that I'm really completely unfamiliar with. We can see the engine that's going on, um, and. Joshua seems to be playing a little bit more of an ag uh, uh, aggro mid-range list with a heavy top end, something like Chernabog. So I think if I was Albert, I'd be playing a pretty aggressive opening myself. And honestly, just going with the same Ruby Amethyst game plan that you normally see, which is just be as aggressive as you can on the opening and close out with cards like Merlin Goat uh, when it might be a little bit more difficult for your characters to gain much value. No, I think that's right. You know, anytime you're playing uh, Amethyst, you know, you, you once you get to 16, 17, 18 lore, especially when you have bounce cards available, you know, you're within striking distance of winning the game. So I do think Albert uh, should be thinking about, or is probably thinking about, pushing his lore um, as much as he can early, forcing Joshua in a position where he has to respond to Albert's board state um, and can't quest on his own. And that'll allow Albert to get to a place in the game later on where a lot of his answers are available. It is important that he hits his card draw in the mid game, though, perhaps a rabbit or a castle that he can start leveraging uh, to get extra cards to, to draw into those answers, though. Yeah, I'll also be interested if we see Albert start bouncing his cards with Mim and Fox, because as you mentioned in game one, Amber and Amethyst don't have great removal tools, at least for cards that are readied. They really rely on being able to play cards that exert other cards so that they can be challenged and banished, but it, uh, if Albert is able to play his cards in a way where he's playing them, questing with them, and then picking them back up with something like Madame Mim Snake or Madame Mim Fox, and then being able to replay them so that they're ready, it may be really difficult for Joshua to respond when he's in this uh, situation where he's on the draw, so he's in a position of needing to respond to Albert first. Absolutely. Chernabog's minion is a great tournament play for Joshua. Uh, one, uh, he, he can respond to the Rafiki questing if he wants to. Or um, it's another one drop that makes complete sense in this deck. Uh, you can quest with Chernabog's minions, and when you do, you can banish it to draw a card, putting it into your discard pile, but available to come back uh, with a Perdita. Yeah, it can come back for a Perdita, and it's also helping discount your big Chernabog in your hand if you don't want to bring it back with Perdita. Then either option is great, right? Because if you bring it back, you can quest and banish it again to draw another card, and you can just kind of keep that loop going with Perdita. When you're finally ready to play the Chernabog, you can banish it and keep it in your discard to discount the Chernabog by one more ink cost. And already it seems like we see Albert responding to Joshua and what he is playing. Interesting. So Albert definitely going with it with a go-wide, more aggressive strategy, getting a lot of characters on board early um, and trying to push that lore total a little bit. Joshua expecting that might be the game plan, removing the Rafiki, not letting it quest uh, for free in perpetuity, and then Albert responding by removing that Chernabog's minions, not letting him get the card drop, but perhaps in the next turn. As a, co or as a, a downside to that, you know, that mini wasn't available to quest, but here Albert with uh, much better control of the board uh, after this turn. Yeah, and to be honest, I know we talked about how difficult it might be for Josh to respond to Albert, but if Joshua can just put himself in a place where Albert is having to respond to him, I think Joshua is just in a better place because of this engine that he has where he can adapt to whatever is happening in the game, whether a bunch of characters are being sent to his discard that he can pull back with Perdita, or he can play a Chernabog because of the amount of characters in his discard, or if he is gaining some sort of advantage and he wants to keep Albert from trying to do something like play Be Prepared by playing Mufasa so that when Mufasa gets banished, Joshua can play another card off the top of his deck. Joshua, I mean, this whole deck feels like it's just going to be constant pressure all the time, and it's going to take Albert. He's going to have to be really careful about when he puts the pressure on, when he's questing, when he's gaining, or pushing his win condition, and then how he's responding to Joshua so that he's not feeding the uh, game plan that Joshua is working on at that moment. Absolutely. I will say here it is. It is important that the rabbit came out uh, turn four, highlighting that mid-game card draw. That rabbit uh, gains a card or gives you a card when you, it enters play, and then when it leaves play, you also get to draw a card, uh, netting you two cards. Um, you know, Albert put a lot on the board early, uh, went pretty wide, um, reducing his hand size, and those are the cards that he also needs to ink. So, uh, getting a few extra cards here is important, and will allow him to keep going. Absolutely, and we see Joshua cleaning up the board state just a little bit, uh, using the crab to banish the Maleficent, and using the Cusco to banish the Mini, uh, and Cusco being banished, being able to draw a card, and then Joshua doing the exact same thing that Albert is doing, playing a rabbit on turn four to draw a card. We do see a Maui come out from Albert. Now he has Rush and Reckless. It's an inkable five cost six five, uh, so it can banish quite a few things, and because it has Reckless, it has to challenge if able, and because 
because it has rush, it's able to challenge the turn that it's played. So we see it go straight into this Merlin Crab, which I think is worth doing because Merlin Crab has an ability that gives a character challenge three on play and when it uh, leaves play. So if you can, you want to remove Crab on your turn if you're playing against it so that your opponent can't use that challenger plus three against you. And we see a great response by Joshua here, just playing a Mufasa, saying, I know you don't want this on board, but if you remove it, uh, I'll be able to hopefully find a character from the top of my deck and just replay something else. Yeah, it's important to note we're now into uh, turn six. Um, Albert now um, has uh, several removal options opened up to him that can deal with that Mufasa from Madame Medusa, Lady uh, Tremaine um, at six sync. And so um, Joshua, knowing that, uh, plays it, um, perhaps hoping to get something good off the top deck. You know, these decks are often referred to as Mufasa roulette decks because uh, you never know what you're going to get off the top deck. Um, and I'm always excited to see what's pulled when that card's banished. Yeah, I'm really, uh, I'm having so much fun watching this match, watching Joshua pilot this deck because it's so new. And it just goes to show to anybody listening that you don't have to follow what everybody else is telling you. You know, I don't think I've heard a single person mention Amber Amethyst in regards to bringing it to this 2,000 player tournament. Joshua seems to have cooked up this uh, deck that has a really great engine running and is having serious success with it. We can see just how difficult of a position it puts your opponents in with the way he's playing Perdita and Mufasa. Um, and I just think it's awesome to see such a unique deck all the way up here in the top four. Uh, there goes that rabbit banishing Mufasa, giving Albert a card, but also giving a Floodborne Fairy Godmother Joshua off the top deck. We see another Maui coming down, getting rid of that Fairy Godmother, saying, I don't want you to get the value off of the Fairy Godmother. I don't want you to give your characters challenger and then give them the ability to bounce back into your hand when they're banished in a challenge. Hmm. Joshua also, I'll note, every time something goes into a discard pile, he does a quick count, takes a look at what's in there, uh, counts the number of characters available there uh, for a very important reason. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if there's a Chernabog sitting in his hand right now, and that is why he is counting up. And look, right there, we have a very beautiful enchanted Chernabog in his hand. He's counting to see how much ink he has and how many characters he has in play, wondering if it's worth to play down the Chernabog right now because, I mean, Chernabog is a very difficult card to get rid of. We talk about how great Ruby is at banishing other characters, but if we're honest, a lot of that is kind of conditional. A card like Madame Medusa that has seen a ton of play in the set three meta and I would say a meta-defining card uh, is usually really strong, but she only banishes cards with three strength or less. And Chernabog is a whopping 9-9 nine, nine, uh, character. So outside of something like a Be Prepared, there's not usually any other great answers to such a large card in Ruby Amethyst. No, that's absolutely right. There, there's an interesting game going on here when it comes to the removal where um, we're, we're at turn seven now. So um, Albert has B oh, and we see two B prepared in his hand, and Joshua knows that in turn seven, B prepared are an option. Albert has probably drawn aggressively to get those and probably altered his hand aggressively to find at least one, seeing how many characters were on board last game. So Joshua has to put enough on board that he draws out the B prepared and gets them played on his terms, putting characters on the board that he doesn't mind uh, being banished, for example, Kuzco, which will give him a card, or Fasa, which will give him a card off the top deck, um, but he has to put enough pressure there to have Albert play it when he wants him to play it. Yeah, and the really interesting thing about this that Joshua is doing such a good job of doing is he's forcing Albert to play these V-Prepares with these whiteboards. We saw the piglet that was going to quest for three lore. Mufasa was going to quest for two lore. Um, and he's playing characters like Mufasa and Cusco, like you said, that gain a benefit off of being banished. But it's just too much lore on board for Albert to ignore. And on top of that, when Albert plays such a big card like Be prepared to put all these cards in his discard, we can see Joshua counting it again. It is just further discount counting that Turnabog that's sitting in his hand. And there it is, the second be prepared. You know, Joshua knew Albert probably had one. He didn't know if he had two. Now we know he did. Um, so clearing the board again there. And no immediate benefit from Mufasa there. Um, so Joshua starting with a blank board. But here comes Perdita. And when Perdita comes into play, we always see something that comes with it. Yeah, we'll see if Joshua decides to play anything with the Perdita. Mm. Looking at his discard currently. He's going to decide to... Nice. Okay, he's taking a second. I know we have a Piglet. I think we have a Cusco in there as well, also a Pascal. 
So he has quite a few options. He could bring the Piglet back if he wants to, to try to push for some lore. Piglet gains an extra two lore when there are two other characters on board. Uh, so that would be an interesting thing to push for extra lore. You could obviously bring back a Cusco if you wanted to, to guarantee a little bit more draw. But it looks like Joshua is going to bring back the Piglet and push for that lore. Oh, yes. And he okay, still I has enough for the Chernobyl. I love this play. Oh, my goodness. Now, he's saying, uh, Albert, do you have a third be prepared? Yeah, he is pushing so much lore with this board. Three lore off of the Trinobog, three lore off of the Piglet, and two lore off of the Perdita. It's going to give him eight lore in one turn unless Albert is able to respond with a be prepared. And uh, it looks like he doesn't have it. He's just playing the rabbit. Um, but I love this because, like I said, Piglet is going to quest for three when there's two other characters on board. Perdita can bring cards back from discard. Um, and rather than playing something like the Cusco with the with the Perdita. He said, you know what? I'll bring back the Piglet, the thing that's going to push my win condition, and then I'm going to shuffle all those before I shuffle all those cards back into my deck when I play my Chernobog for free. Yeah, and unfortunately, Chernobog is just so big, and there's so many characters on board that a lot of the traditional removal options for Ruby um, aren't aren't really available. Madame Medusa requires a character that's that's three or less strength, and then Lady Tremaine requires you to banish a character. But if you have so many on board, Piglet becomes a, an easy choice, perhaps, um, leaving Chernobog up uh, and able to quest. So, um, at one point, it looked like Joshua asked uh, the number of ink that Albert had on board, and I'm wondering if he wanted to see if he had nine, if Maleficent was an option uh, to deal with that Chernobog, because um, it really is the only removal answer right now to deal with that Chernobog, I think. Yeah, and a lot of Ruby Amethyst players aren't even playing Maleficent Monster Dragon in their decks because Ruby Amethyst has leaned a little bit more mid-range and tempo-oriented rather than control, so Albert may not even be playing that card, but I think you're right. It's one of the few cards that could get rid of the Chernobog. The only other one that I can think of is Lady Tremaine, but that requires basically every other card on Joshua's side of the board to be banished so that Joshua is forced to choose the Chernobog on Lady Tremaine's ability. Um, and other than that, it's be prepared. We've already seen two, maybe three be prepared at this point from Albert. Two at least. So uh, he's definitely running out of steam here. And as you can see, Albert started with six lore early in the game. But right now, Joshua is looming over him with a ton of lore and only uh, three lore currently on board for Joshua. But, I mean, that's a total of eight, nine lore total that he could quest with in one turn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, these, these matches just are, are so tense, you know. Um, and we also should mention they're untimed at this point, um, you know, with the tournament organizers understanding that each player wants to think very carefully about each each play, making sure they're making the optimal play, and giving each, each player the maximum opportunity to... ...scenario in the future. But Albert has a lot of ink that he still can use. I don't under, I don't know what's in his hand currently. Uh, he seems to be looking at his discard to see what his options are. Yeah, he's, he's thinking long and hard about this. I think, you know, if, if he is drawing for answers, you know, obviously be prepared is, is one that he would, he would love to see again now. Um, you know, the alternate play with a rabbit is to, is to send it into Chernobog, perhaps get a card if you really need to draw a card. Um, if he thinks he can draw this game out another turn and survive until another, uh, he gets the opportunity to draw again, um, removing that piglet uh, may be the way to do it. But um, gosh, just really agonizing over this decision. Yeah, and we can see the update to the lore down at the bottom. Uh, Albert only at six, and Joshua, I thought that I thought there was a mistake there. Yeah, Joshua, behind a little bit. Joshua had uh, pushed up to 11 lore in one turn. He was sitting at only three, and then he was able to quest for uh, quite a bit more with the Chernobog and the Piglet well, there. I think and that would have been game. It would have been nine. Yeah, it would have been nine. And so, like, I mean, Joshua almost has the game on board and I don't even know if we've seen a single goat from Joshua either so he's playing Amethyst and you know we've seen it plenty of times when all they have to do is get close to 20 and then a few Merlin goats can finish the game friends from the other side drawing two cards look for some answers here OK, 
Okay, Albert does find the Madam Medusa to get rid of the Perdita, which is pretty good because that means Perdita will not be able to get the Piglet back from the discard this next turn, threatening three lore again. That's one of the challenges playing against Joshua's deck is every time you banish a character, it feels like it's not actually gone. It feels like it can come back at <laughs> any I moment. Until I see you again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Either through Perdita or just Chernabog, shuffling them all back into the deck to eventually be drawn. Rapunzel Gift of Healing coming down. A set one card, very popular, that allows you to uh, heal a character for up to three damage and draw a card for each damage counter you remove. We see a Merlin Crab coming into play just to push even more lore. Looking at seven lore this turn, or for next turn on Joshua's end, uh, which would be game. So Albert really has to find an answer, find a way to get Joshua under six lore on board. And I think that's going to be a real feat because you really need to get rid of the Chernabog or you have to get rid of a bunch of other characters. <laughs> you really do. It's, it's, it's really the Chernabog, um, even if you get rid of two of the one lores or even if you get rid of the two lore character. Um, yeah, this is tough. Albert's going to start by challenging the Fairy Godmother, getting one lore off of the board. Now Joshua only has six, but that still is going to get him to 20 the next turn. So Albert needs to find a way to take out one more card. We have six, oh, I was going to say Lady Tremaine or Medusa. There it is. So only four lore represented the board now. This will draw this game out another turn um, at the very least. And Joshua does not currently have a goat in hand, at least not that I can see. So now that we're under the 20 lore mark, I mean, the game's not over, but Albert has a lot of climbing back to do if he wants to take this game. One other thing that I think Ruby Amethyst struggles with in this matchup is Ruby Amethyst has a lot of removal, has a lot of ways to deal with the board, uh, and it's very difficult for them to get rid of something like a Chernabog, but even when you do get rid of the cards, they're not gone forever, it seems like. They go to the discard, and they can be brought back, and so eventually uh, Ruby Amethyst is going to run out of ways to remove these characters, and unless Albert can find a way to put pressure on himself and end the game before Joshua gets away with it, Joshua's just going to be able to continue to play these cards over and over and over until Albert runs out of options. Oh, dear. Um, Albert uh, returning a Madame Medusa to his hand uh, to play the Madame and Fox, probably as a way to get Madame Medusa back, um, running the Fox into Chernabog to put some damage on it, but playing right into Joshua's hands uh, as Joshua was sitting with a Rapunzel, uh, waiting to remove that damage to draw three more cards, um, giving him way more options uh, at the end game here. Yeah, and one thing that Joshua is doing a great job at is he uh, is only playing enough characters. He's playing enough characters that it makes it difficult for Albert to... He was still both sort of having a pretty decent start at the game. Yeah, and I'm sure Zan is not happy to see that snake bounce that Pinocchio because uh, we know it's going to come down again. And uh, we're passing now. That Pinocchio has really been uh, such an MVP for ever, every player that we've seen playing Amethyst. Uh, yep. Really, really such a great card. Absolutely. Uh, we see a, a small Robin Hood going there, there, so we can shift the large Robin Hood, and the uh, large Robin Hood sings the whole new world. So uh, exactly what you want to be doing on... Um, on uh, Steel Song here, especially when your hand is already quite low, managed to get a lot of uh, cards out of that hand early on and drawing a whole new seven. And Matthew getting rid of five there, I think, including a ghost. Uh, so yeah, great play from Zan there. Exactly what he wants to be doing. And just the uh, the law starts triggling up there from the sleepy fruit. I believe they're both on one there. Yes. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Yeah, seeing that goat go into the discard is too bad. Of course, I'm sure he's running four of them. So hopefully we'll see some more goats later. But it, you never know. I mean, there's 60 cards in that deck, and even though you have maxed out at the four copies that you can have, it doesn't guarantee that you'll see it in the game. So hopefully we do see some more goats come. We see a, a six-drop Yzma there going into the ink well, Not something you often see in uh, Ruby Amethyst. She is another lady on chairs. Ladies uh, on six, chairs. In the six-drop <laughs> alongside Tremaine and Medusa. Uh, very often used as a top deck to the uh, Amethyst Emerald deck, honestly. Uh, I don't see it too often in Ruby, but it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting tech piece here. Yeah, so Matthew has two Yzmas in his deck, just one Lady Tremaine, and he's running three Meta Medusa. So he has uh, a few of all, all the ladies in chairs yeah, are represented here. <laughs> and they all do the same thing in just a different way, really. They all uh, remove something from your opponent's board. Uh, Yzma, you're allowed to choose what is removed. You can use you can remove one of your own characters, in fact. Uh, but whoever owns yes. that character, the, uh, they get to draw two 
the Tremaine uh, is, uh, is a, a, a the opponent chooses a character to banish, and then uh, Medusa uh, banishes any character that costs three or less. Yes, and we do see another goat there, so that's great. Or, three strength or less, excuse me. Uh, yeah, goat coming out, just sort of staying there on the board, keeping up the uh, the law race with the flute there. Yeah, and then he uh, challenged into Robin Hood, which I think is real smart. We don't want that Robin Hood to stick around. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just one of those cards that the more it stays alive, the yeah, the, the more it's going to uh, be gaining uh, gaining tempo. So yeah, definitely worth throwing a few things into that to get rid of it while you can. Ah, and there's our spectacular singer, of course, Ariel, our our poster child for this deck, and uh, such a beautiful card too. I love <laughs> Ariel's my favorite <laughs> Disney character, so I always love to see her come out. <laughs> she grabs an along came Zeus. Uh, which is going to be able to uh, get rid of a, a threat later on. I'm not sure you want to use it against the goat. Uh, we are going to probably see a Benja get inked here. Matthew, if he's playing any items, maybe playing one or two uh, sorcerer's uh, spell books uh, for the uh, for the mirror, but usually uh, it's a pretty safe uh, ink there, a Benja against yeah. the Amethyst. Yeah, he's... Sneak him down. Yeah, he's not running any sorcerer's spell book. I know that's a, a card that you'll often see in a uh, ruby amethyst but not always or sometimes maybe just one or two copies um and matthew does not have any here so i think inking that benja was definitely smart yeah we see a rabbit there just to help refuel the hand both players full hands off the uh, off the back of that whole new world there been uh, giving themselves lots of options uh, to build this board out. Matthew here is going to want to start to uh, develop the board a little bit. Uh, Zan's not giving him stuff to, to swing into with Fox. Uh, I think really his line here is probably castle um, uh, as quick as he can because that is something Zan is going to struggle to uh, to deal with without the uh, Alan Kenzus, although he does know he has at least one of those in hand. Yeah, he does have a whole new world though here. Do you think that he's looking at playing that here? You know, he has the spectacular singer out, so he certainly could. He can sing it. I think if he if he did, he wants to really sort of empty the hand first. Instead, we see uh, Goat take the uh, Along Came Zeus. Um, I think probably going to sort of develop the board a little bit with another flute. Yep. Ah, and, yep. uh, and maybe get next turn uh, another body or two on the board uh, with a view to, to sing it next turn, perhaps. Yeah, which is good news really for Matt because he does have that Queen's Castle in hand, so he's going to hopefully be able to play that next turn. Yeah, now he knows that uh, that Zeus is out of the way. Uh, it's a little bit more of a straighter play to get the uh, the Queen's Castle down, I think. Yes. Yeah, I didn't see. Did Zan have any uh, other Long Came Zeus that he discarded with the last whole new world? Uh, I think that's really. the first one we've seen. I think that is, yeah. So there is a few more in the deck, running a play set of it. Just a great removal in steel. Hits characters oh, yes. and locations, deals five for four. Uh, it is uninkable, but it is singable. So a lot of stuff in the deck can sing it. All of your five drop singers that are singing Grab Your Sword and Whole New World anyway, uh, more than happy to sing that. Um, yes quieter i guess because it's one less thing i don't know <laughs> i'm not sure what the uh, i'm not sure the what right the theming term. is on that yes <laughs> and it's actually just a great song from the movie hercules of course <laughs> the muses sing it and it's oh. a fantastic song <laughs> absolutely uh matthew here inking a mini surfer yeah just double checking uh, as i'm there probably just double checking which one it is you do see play of the one three mini as mm. well so worth yeah. knowing which one's gone there and then uh, a medusa there taking out um the aerial again just sort of slowing down those uh, those five drop songs and um because yeah. yeah, at the moment they would have to be hard cast yeah which in the steel song it you really don't want to have to spend your ink to cast those songs so that you can keep playing your characters out on the board <laughs> and of course he has another aerial to bring down yeah absolutely um and another along came zeus and finds it again that's great <laughs> Um, I think law totals are a little off here. They're going to get updated now. If you bear with us one second. Thank you. There we go. Uh, player two, uh, Zan at six, uh, Matthew at three. You know, I was going to say if he plays along came Zeus again, I'll, I'll sing the line from the song, but now I know he has it in hand. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to commit just yet. Eh? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, Smee quest in there, taking a damage, but yeah, Zan just kind of uh, really putting the pressure on in the law game here. Uh, those flutes absolutely put him work in. Uh, yeah. Smee going to two damage, but most likely will get another turn out. Uh, Matthew having to play two cards here for something like a fox to come in. I think he's probably instead just going to leave that and uh, know that next turn, uh, without 
of Rapunzel, it most likely gets finished off. But I think that is the slight worry here uh, with Amber is that a Rapunzel will heal that Smee back up. So maybe there is something to be said about uh, about trying to take it out here, uh, but it would require Fox and uh, a bounce target for the Fox, I think. Yeah, you can see Matthew's face. He's really thinking about what he wants to do here. You know, not having any bodies on the board, he couldn't bring out a fox unless he plays something else first. Yeah, we see a Pascal. Oh, Pascal. And Pascal is bumping the fox. fox. And the fox goes into, oh, the queen, actually. So trying to shut down the uh, the, 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 the singers fox. as best as can. And oh, wow, look at that. Double fox you play. Yeah, double fox. Uh, pretty amazing there. So we get one of them taking out the queen, the second one bouncing that first one back, who survives this queen uh, challenge, uh, taking out the Smee. Awesome play from Matthew there. Absolutely exactly what he needed to do. That was fantastic. And then, of course, because he bounced that first fox back, he still has another one in his hand. And so yep. Zan knows that fox is waiting. Yeah, and there you go. A really great line getting rid of the Smee there because that Rapunzel would have healed it up, uh, would have drawn yep. two cards. Instead, he's just going to play it to empty his hand ready for the second whole new world of the game. Yes. A whole new world. There, I'll sing that one. Beautiful. <laughs> All right, so this... Yeah, flutes just every turn being able to trickle up that lower total to every turn uh, when Matthew's struggling to keep stuff on the board is uh, is going to be a big problem for him. I, I, I feel like Zan's probably uh, going to take this at game two and we will end up going to a game three. But like I said before, there is no time limit here. It's absolutely worth yeah. playing to your heads because you, you never quite know what line you're going to be able to see. Yeah, Zan really is running away already at 13. And oh, interesting. He's going to damage his own character with Let the Storm Rage on to uh, draw another card. I wonder if he has another Rapunzel waiting in the wings as well to heal mm -hmm. her. Yeah, that's an interesting line. Again, uh, you know, he's he's going to require two cards here to deal with the aerial. Uh, the Rapunzel, even with damage on her there already, is pretty safe. So, yeah, beautiful uh, play there. Just uh, one thing really sort of... Uh, puts players on another level is when they're happy damaging their own stuff just to get that value. Just what they yes. what they rate card draw at is uh, is really interesting to see. And again, yeah, especially with the possibility of another Rapunzel coming down and just helping to continue fueling that hand. Um, yeah, I think I think this one's probably in the bag for Zan, but I I, I do appreciate Matthew playing uh, playing it out because you're just never quite sure what you're going to see. You you never know. Uh... And with Ruby Amethyst, he does have uh, seven ink. So if he had to be prepared, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he would have played it already if he had drawn it. But mm -hmm. yeah, you're getting a bit of value out of the be prepared. Obviously, the flutes are still sticking around, though. Yeah. Um, Zan has a full hand of cards, a good number of ink to be able to rebuild the board after it. Um, yes, it's going to be doing some work here, but uh, not quite as much as you want. Maui is going to be able to take out Singer. We don't mind that. Don't mind that at all, but I, I don't know if that was enough. Uh, no, I, I mean, I don't know what is at this point, yeah. honestly, but you know, yeah. playing playing to the best of his ability, playing with what he's got, it's all you can really ask. Uh, at this point in the competition, uh, like I said, it really is just worth playing it out. And yep. there is the Rapunzel There's to the heal Rapunzel. up again. A little bit of a, yep. a no, acknowledging nod from Matthew there. Um, just sort of, you know, the little things like that are really nice to see when two players come together like this. They can just acknowledge that the other player knows exactly what they're doing and, and they're really having to play to the uh, to the top of their abilities here. Absolutely. I'm sure all these players here in the top eight, top four, are just have so much respect for each other. They're all such skilled players. They have built some incredible decks and they're all playing so well. I, uh, I believe actually Matthew and uh, Zan know each other as well, and they're and they're oh, local. Nice. They're local to the area, I believe. So. Oh, that's fantastic! I'm sure they've probably gone through this game a lot uh, beforehand. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> there we go. And we're singing a song. We just play, playing the song, but it does get the two law off the flute. Yes. Flutes don't mind if they're sung or not; uh, they just want to see the uh, the song get played. Uh, we can come, uh, we can something there for another one drop queen. Haven't seen the uh, the shift queen here, but uh, the yeah. the threat of it has been enough for Matthew to deal with that small queen before. So it, yes. uh, it may well happen again. Uh, but now we have a seventeen. We have four, five on the board. Uh, flutes are going to get you two of that, even with a song. I'm pretty sure Matthew needs to go to game three here, and that's exactly what he does. Yeah, uh, that was very well played by both players. Matthew just didn't have the right answers to him and how it plays yeah. out. Uh, so uh, decks have been uh, altered there. We need to get a shuffle from both of them. 
and then we'll be able to start. Yeah, so uh, just a reminder then, because people are, people may be watching thinking, hold on a minute, that was only game one. Uh, no, we did actually uh, skip game one in an attempt to kind of uh, bring the stream a little bit up to speed for you folks. Uh, Matthew took game one. That was game two there that we saw Zan uh, win. And so now we are going into the final game of the best of three format. Um, we move to best of three when we get to the... Um, uh, the, uh, the the single elimination cut of the second day because there has to be a clear winner. We need to know who's moving on. Uh, it moves away from uh, match uh, game wins being the focus of day one to accrue points into full match wins uh, for the single elimination of day two. Uh, we see a chain box followers coming down here for Matthew. Yes, and, and Matthew during game one was on the play and Zan was on the play in game two. And so Matthew is back doing that first turn again and we'll see how much that comes into. How much do you think with these decks in particular? Because I think for some decks, you really going first is a, a huge advantage. Yeah, I think I think it is. And I think for both of these decks, it is honestly. Uh, the, mm. the, the, the board tempo of Ruby Amethyst really wants to come down early and put some threats down. Down, uh, but then also Zan just wanting to get that first whole new world sang as quick yes. as possible. So yeah, the the uh, there's always going to be a slight advantage to going first, as there is in any two player uh, game. Uh, like I said before, you know, ask any white white piece players in chess, uh, they'll tell you that there's a, <laughs> there's a first turn advantage. So uh, it's a tale as old as time, but it is relatively yes. prevalent in some of the decks more than others. Uh, I think decks that ramp a little bit into the late game can do a little better recovering from a turn two play, but here, yeah, you really want to be coming out of the gate singing. Uh, so we see a Minnie Mouse here. Uh, we saw those inked quite a bit in the last game, but now they're going to yes. come down and start threatening some early lore lead. So we do finally see a singer. I think he just drew that Cinderella, but he didn't have any other singers in his hand until just now. Uh, and we also don't see that whole new world. So yeah, I'm it's, sure it's, he's... Yeah. Slow start for Zan here, unfortunately. We yeah. don't see a whole new world. I, we do see the shift uh, queen, which yep. I, I feel like is a pretty uh, pretty strong play here, even though... Oh, no, we're going to ink oh, it. Wow, okay. Uh, so even though there's nothing to exert here, I still don't mind uh, seeing that come down. Perhaps instead we see a flute. Yeah. And, and there's uh, and a the Cinderella coming out. So is that next turn then the songs are going to be online. Uh, Smee can start questing here. Uh, not sure what Matthew's checking on the Cinderella, but yeah, we're up to a couple of law now with the Smee. Yes. And that Smee does take that damage since there are no captains out. And uh, Rapunzel can come out as early as turn four, correct? That's right, yeah. So, so Smee's... Uh, just a really great quester on his own right. If you do have a captain out, he doesn't take that damage at the end of the turn if he's exerted. But um, but yeah, even even with that happening, most likely you're getting sort of four uh, or even if uh, with a perfect run six uh, ink out of uh, six lore out of him. Excuse me. Uh, but yeah, here in an amber steel build, that Rapunzel can come down yeah. um, and yeah. take. Uh, it's coming down on turn four, she's only taking one damage from him because the damage does apply at the end of the turn. Um, so there is something to be said about maybe holding. Rapunzel back for a turn if you feel like the Smee is going to survive, so you can draw two off that healing instead. Uh, but yeah, you know, sometimes just a, the decent body of Rapunzel coming down who does quest for two in her own right and keeping that Smee alive for a turn, uh, maybe that's enough. Yeah. So we see a second mini mouse here come down, and those minis, they quest for two, and I think that is really great for Matthew. He wasn't able to get on much lore in the last game, and so I, I'm sure that he wants to get on the board here and stay ahead of Zan as much as possible. Absolutely making the most of the turn one advantage here and putting those minis down and just becoming the aggressor, just really putting the pressure on with the uh, with the questing uh, and, and making Zan. I'm not too sure really, you know, options-wise, I don't think there's any evasive uh, play in Zan's deck, so he's going to be looking for uh, targeted removal for those minis. Uh, we do see a uh, Rapunzel getting inked mm, there, inked. and then two. Uh, may well put down the. Oh, there we go. Now we uh, see the. Now we see the queen. shift queen. Uh, now any other time it would be a really great quester. Uh, to give something a uh, big enough challenge and get a free trade with the mini there. But like I say, mini is evasive. So uh, they're not going to be able to do that. Instead, he uses the shift ability uh, to be able to sing a whole new world. Uh, they're ditching a uh, grab your sword and Matthew losing a couple of rabbits by the looks of things. So uh, yeah. so should, so giving Matthew cards, but shutting down um, some more board presence with those. It'd be interesting to see what Matthew's able to do with the whole fresh hand here. Yeah. 
it really is, like you said, it's a, that kind of, a little bit of a double-edged sword because it does give your player, your opponent, a whole new hand, a whole new world. A, a whole new, new hand, hand. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and he gets to see that hand. In fact, he just played Bare Necessities, one of my favorite songs, and he can discard any non-character card, and he chooses the Queen's Castle. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Matthew's a little sad to see that go, but yeah. the Bare Necessities can get rid of items, locations, songs, and yeah, that Queen's Castle... It was the only target for him, but it's definitely, you know, a good target because it is going yeah. to be something that he struggles to deal with a little bit um, with uh, with this, with with steel, uh, amber steel, other than the uh, the, the uh, and then along came Zeus. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff in steel, amethyst, the stuff that's sticking to the board has got big, uh, you know, big bodies, but not great challenging necessarily. Their willpower is usually where the stats go. Um, so it can, sometimes can be difficult to deal with those. So. Uh, yeah. Yes. Otherwise, uh, yeah, good play there. Matthew's uh, really having to think now because board parity is, is pretty much there now. He, he's. I don't think it's going to be enough just to be uh, keep questing. He's going to start to have to deal with some issues here. Luckily, Amethyst is very good at that. Uh, we can get rid of that queen while we can. We are having to sacrifice the snake into it, but I, I don't mind that at all. Uh, yeah. That queen sticking around and questing, not only questing for two, but making Zan's trades much, much fairer, fixing the problem almost of Amber Steel's uh, smaller strength uh, uh, characters. Yes, yeah. We also um, uh, didn't say, but Strength of Raging Fire was played and took out one of Matthew's minis. So he had yes. two on the board and and one of those went. So yeah, he's got that turn of box followers and he's trading it into to me. So really trying to take care of this board. And, and does Maui. so. Absolutely does <laughs> yes, so. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the Mary there finishing off Cinderella and still being able to quest uh, with two there. Yeah, really great turn from Matthew actually. That that if we look back at this game afterwards, that may well have been the turn that uh, that swung it. That was a that was a really great use of his resources there. Uh, just on five ink was able to do that. Really good. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, and on Ruby Amethyst, I know we've talked about this before, but you don't really need a lot of ink to do a lot. Um, you know. No, I mean you're very often sort of trying to get up to seven just so that yep. be prepared. The big, you know, the big red button is online. Um, but yeah, <laughs> often a lot of the stuff you want to do because of the uh, because of the bounce uh, package of uh, of Madam Mim, you're very often able to run at a slightly lower ink uh, ink count. Uh, you know, very often your early plays of Chernobog's followers, Pascal's, Rafiki's, if they're not able to do what they want to do, uh, very often they're great bounce targets for the fox, and then they become your ink moving into the mid game. So wow. uh, you know, it's almost card. -driven. We got a double mini surfer coming down yes, here. Yes. Uh, Triplets so here. Six, wow, six. <laughs> talk about steel songs. Uh, we've got the 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 three the trio of uh, uh, over here could sing a lovely song. I'm sure the minis are going to be exerting for six ink next turn. That's uh, kind of huge. We have a Robin Hood comes down, wants to challenge, can't Big hit ten. any of them. <laughs> yeah, like you said, Steel really doesn't have in this Steel Song deck. There's no evasive characters. We're well, holding we worlding again. The last world. one, the last one gave him those minis, so it'd be really yep. interesting to see what the next one gets. But at this point, <laughs> Zan is just going to be looking for answers. Needs to find those. Uh, along came Zeus. I do see one in his hand, but that's only getting rid of a third of the problem right now. Yep, I think he has a strength of raging fire there too. Okay. Uh, we'll keep ticking up the, the law with flute, but uh, instantly that one law gain off the flute uh, pales in comparison to the uh, to those minis. Oh, those minis. There. Yeah, triple minis is, is really kind of the same. Matthew's got to be super happy about that. Love to see it. Yeah, I mean, she's small, but she's mighty. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just that evasive, you know, it's just one of those things that sometimes decks just don't have an answer. Um, so, yeah, we've got a couple of Robin Hoods there. Uh, it's, you know, his body's on the board, so maybe try and keep up the pace with the law gaining. But um, yeah, at this point, three minis being able to ready there is yeah. kind of huge. We can see a big quest here, I think. Um, you know, we may just see uh, Matthew extend the board a little bit. We see a Medusa getting rid of the Robin Hood. Oh my goodness, this is absolutely wow. huge. What a swing. That's uh, a yeah, six evasive, six evasive <laughs> law. And Zan left with uh, one ones across the board. Uh, absolutely huge. Does not look good for Zan at this point. No, that Medusa really, really was wonderful to take out that Robin Hood and to be able to quest here for six. He's up to 13. So right now, it's unless Zan has uh, some answers, which yep, he does so. take care of one of those minis, uh, then, yeah, we're looking at a couple turns away from a win here for Matt. 
Yeah, so that's exactly what he needed the Zeus uh, to get rid of one of them, but needs to find the others really to to get rid of the rest of them. They're just going to keep questing um, at the moment. That. Does strength find a strength fire. there with the three characters mm. out, and that was probably the reason for putting the Robins last out, last turn, uh, just getting them down, knowing that he was going to need that strength to be bigger. Strength there, dealing damage equal to the number of characters you have on the board. Uh, so that mm. was uh, those Robins coming down there. Didn't feel like much at the time, but really it was just sort of future proofing, so that that strength was going to be online the next turn. Yeah, that, and again, that's just evidence of these players thinking ahead, knowing he wants to take out one of those evasives with that song and that he needs the characters on the board and able to do it. Absolutely. Um, at this point, I think Matthew just kind of needs to quest. Uh, I thought the, I thought the uh, <laughs> footage had froze for a second. Both of the players went incredibly still. Uh, yes, yes, yes. They're, they're, still, <laughs> they're just, just thinking. Still I think they're it's just, still Zan's turn right now. There and we go. They're, they're just, just yeah. Just taking a look at this guys again, just trying to find some yeah. outs. Um, you know, I think Matthew's just getting a, a good idea of what's going on in the game. Just probably seeing how many of those uh, steel removal spells have gone because at this point, um, yeah. what he's maybe thinking is, do I try and pick that mini back up with a fox or something, keep her safe, or am I safe? Am I am I happy just leaving her out there and keeping the pressure on? Yeah. And, and as we've already mentioned at this point in the tournament, these matches are untimed. And so the players are really taking their time here to think through every move, uh, every possible line of play. Love that the, lady uh, Tremaine coming Tremaine, down. Tremaine, yeah. I mean, Dan's just able to choose uh, one of his uh, one of his one drops to uh, to banish here. Uh, probably just looking to see how many of the shift targets have gone, but really at this point, that's an extra bonus. The the uh, the train's just coming down as a two law quester here at this point. Yeah, yeah. yep. She she quests for two, which is great at this point in the game. He's up to sixteen now, and so he has enough on the board to take it next turn. Absolutely, and there's two ready characters and an evasive character still on the board there. So Zan's going to have to pull out some uh, a, a lot of steel removal here. I I I'll never say never, but I'd, I'd be very surprised if he finds an answer to this board state. Yeah, he's he's thinking hard here. I'm not sure what he has in his hand, but I, what what answers could there be here? Um, I mean, a grab your sword is going to get rid of uh, Cusco. Just the Cusco, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, mm. Yeah, the uh, the one drops, you know, shifting the one drops and then singing a bigger song with them may get rid of one thing, but he's really going to have to um, really just have every line here. I I I. I yeah, I, I I can't I can't quite do the math on what he could have, but I don't feel like there's enough here. We're hard casting a uh, let the storm rage on to put two onto the mini to draw a card. Maybe again, maybe just looking for that grab your sword, mm. thinking it'll take out the mini, and there's uh, game. And that was it. Yeah, yeah. Game. that was amazing. Oh, fantastic! Matthew. All right, we already talked about a lot of what each player needs to see in the opening. Joshua, I imagine is going to go first. He is the higher seated player at the 19th seed. Matthew is at the 24th seed, and I imagine Joshua wants to go first in this game. So uh, Joshua is running quite a few one-drop characters. He's playing a couple Pascals, a couple Trinobox followers, um, even Cinderella. So I expect to see one of those in the beginning. Oh, it looks like Matthew's actually deciding to go first yeah. on this one. Uh, and talking about, you know, being aggressive and going right early and, and deck adaptations, Pascal uh, is a fun little card that's run uh, in a lot of decks right now, but I don't think you see it terribly often in Ruby Amethyst, so it's fun to see here uh, as a one-drop, and Joshua responding with his own Pascal. Um, cards are great if they have evasive, uh, unless your opponent has one as well. Yeah, it's very funny when we see these Pascals sort of staring at each other, because until somebody decides to exert one, like Matthew's doing, then, it's like you said, they both have evasive, uh, but when everything has evasive, nothing has evasive, and Matthew actually responds <laughs> by saying, look, your Pascal can sit there and threaten my Pascal, but my Pascal has a Madam M snake chasing it, and he's trying to get out of here. <laughs> so he's going to quest and bounce right back to Matthew's hand out of harm's way from Joshua's Pascal. So here we go, taking a look at Piglet. Uh, Piglet is a, is a fun little aggressive card. Uh, it only has one lore, um, but when... Uh, you have two characters on board. It gets an additional two lore from a quest for three. In this instance, though, going to the Inkwell and a Kuzco coming on board. Kuzco is a one-two with one lore. Uh, when it's banished, however, uh, its owner gets to draw a card. Now, I want to highlight something. We do see Joshua's hand, and we've talked about the engine that he has built in this deck with Perdita, being able to bring back some really strong cards like Piglet and like Cusco. We see that the Perdita is in hand, and we also see another Piglet is in hand. Uh, that might be why he was able to ink the first Piglet to begin with. And we also see Cusco on board. 
Cusco does a great job of replacing itself. So as soon as Cusco goes into the discard, Joshua will get to draw a card uh, once Cusco is banished. But Perdita can bring Cusco right back from the discard pile back into play, uh, allowing Cusco to pair with things like Merlin Crab to trade up or even just push his lore lead by questing, knowing that if Matthew wastes a turn challenging Cusco, uh, Matthew's not questing and the Cusco is going to go straight to the discard and, Matthew, and Joshua might have the Perdita to just bring him right back again. Yeah, I do think in this matchup, Joshua is probably happy to take this uh, game long. Um, and wants to take this game into a point where he, he takes over the board with some of his Mufasas and, and some of his cards where he gets a lot of value out of it. So at this point, having a Kuzco go to the discard pile that he can recur to get some card draw off in the early game is I think what he wants to do more than getting that more aggressive piglet on the board and trying to quest early. Yeah, and we talked about this kind of opening that we might want to see from Matthew, playing something like a Minnie Mouse Stylish Surfer, a couple evasive cards to uh, get an early lore lead. And I feel like that Pascal played by Joshua sort of stopped this game plan. Uh, maybe Matthew didn't have the Mickey, or sorry, the Minnie Mouse Silas Surfer in hand anyway, but I don't think Matthew is starting as fast as he would like to against a deck like this for the reasons you just said. I think Joshua is looking to go into the late game if he can because he has those recursion um, abilities through Perdita. He has cards like Mufasa that he can play uh, that can continue to quest or challenge or really do anything uh, and then use his ability when banished or when leaving to uh, take a character from the top of the deck and put it onto the board. So here we go. Getting that crab down on turn three allows Matthew to sing friends from the other side, get a few more cards. And here we see him taking the line I think that we expected if it was available to him, and that's going wide uh, with characters that can push the lore lead, um, getting a Pascal on board again. Um, and one thing to mention about Joshua is he doesn't have a lot of removal other than challenging. Um, there's nothing that does damage to his opponent's characters or even really bounces his opponent's characters. Um, it's really challenging or nothing. And so if Matthew can build up a wide board, um, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for Joshua, and he's going to have to be the player responding uh, to Matthew's aggression. Yeah, that's a great point, Liam. And something that I find interesting in this deck is an Amethyst card that we see quite frequently that helps Amethyst with this problem of having to challenge characters because they have so little removal is uh, Pinocchio. Um, and there aren't any Pinocchios in Joshua's deck list. Now, the Fairy Godmother that we do see on board has a similar ability when a Cinderella card is played, but Joshua is only playing four Cinderella Barroom Sensations, so you have to sort of combo that together if you want to force Matthew to exert one of his cards that are readied. So if I, I agree with you. If Matthew can go really wide here and make it difficult for Joshua to respond because he doesn't have options to deal with a wide board, he may be able to just overwhelm Joshua's engine that he's working with and squeak his way into 20 lore. No, absolutely. Uh, Fairy Godmother here removing the crab. I think this is a, an interesting play. It does two things uh, for Joshua. One, uh, it does get the crab off the board to avoid any more bounce shenanigans, uh, allowing uh, him to give Challenger 3 to one of his cards. But it also removes a 3-cost singer from the board. And if I'm looking at this game, I think Joshua has the feeling that Matthew doesn't quite have the cards he needs uh, using friends to draw. And so uh, if Matthew has drawn into another friend from the other side, would love to sing it right now, uh, but that 9 is not available anymore with that 3-cost off the board. Yeah, I also really like like this fairy godmother because of her stats she is a three four i believe just at three costs so she can trade really well into that crab surviving the challenge and uh being able to take another challenge from one of matthew's characters or challenge again we also see joshua play the peter pan shadow a card we haven't Great seen card. for quite a while it's an evasive card uh, with rush i believe and it gives other rush characters evasive so even if matthew wanted to go the route of playing the pascals playing the Minnie mouse stylish surfers and questing with him, he has to be wary now because something like a Madame M. Fox that has Rush uh, can gain evasive with Peter Pan's shadow on board. We see Matthew deciding to use his Pascal to challenge Joshua's Pascal, knowing that Matthew's evasive characters are essentially turned off at this point because of that Peter Pan's shadow. I think this is going to be a key card in this matchup, and it's going to really make it difficult for Matthew to get under Joshua for this game. No, that's a great point. Peter Pan's Shadow is, is a really interesting card, a great card to see here. Um, the first one we've seen today, but these are really originally popped in the meta during uh, Rise of the Floodborne, and they were they were popped in primarily to deal with Minnie Mouse Stylish Surfers, pairing with Foxes, as you suggested, to remove those um, because they were they were getting out of control. People were getting a lot of lore off of them. So now in this current meta, they're, they're additionally handy to deal with Tinkerbells and other evasive cards that people have started working in. But in this instance, serving its 
original purpose in serving as a counter to uh, Minnie Mouse stylish surfer, perhaps, if Matthew plays that, um, and also threatening a Pascal. Uh, Matthew, of course, choosing to trade Pascals with Joshua um, now that his Pascal isn't safe anymore. Yeah, I find it really interesting. Like you said, the Peter Pan Shadow was a counter to Ruby Amethyst mirror matches, and here we see it's not a mirror match, but we see that same technique being used against the Ruby Amethyst deck in the finals, and it's just as effective. We also see Joshua playing a Merlin Goat, which will gain Joshua a lore every time it enters and leaves play. So if Joshua has any Madame M snakes, Madame M foxes that have to bounce a character back to his hand when played, he can utilize this goat to bring it in play and out of play multiple times, gaining multiple lore at a burst speed. And we see him running away already up at seven lore while Matthew is only at three currently. Another thing to highlight about GOAT, I mean, we focus a lot on its lore gain ability, which I think is its, its obviously its best use, um, and you want to make maximum use of bouncing that GOAT back to your hand so it enters and leaves play multiple times, but it's also a decently statted uh, for a mid-game card with four uh, strength. Uh, not a lot of willpower, but um, if you're worried about controlling your opponent's board, um, it's a card that you can put on to give yourself a little extra oomph on the challenge. Yeah, it's putting Matthew in a really difficult spot right here, because if Matthew decides to exert the snake or the rabbit, whether that's to challenge or to quest. Uh, the goat, if Joshua wants to, can challenge to either of them, and in fact could challenge into the rabbit, survive the challenge, and then be bounced back to hand, taking that damage off. So it puts Matthew in a really tough decision here. He wants to get rid of the Cusco because the Cusco is continuing to gain one lore every single turn, uh, and he does decide to challenge the Cusco with the snake, knowing that if the Merlin Goat does challenge into the snake, at least it will be banished as well. The Cusco when banished will draw a card for Joshua, so he adds another card to hand, and I really like this play from Matthew, playing a Lady Tremaine. When Lady Tremaine is played, your opponent has to choose a card to banish. So Joshua goes for the Merlin Goat here, meaning that takes away any lines of play that Joshua was going to use, like bouncing the goat or challenging the snake back. And it also leaves a two lore character on board. So in a game where you're trying to race your opponent to 20, like Lorcana, anytime you can get an effect out of a card and then you have a card with two or more lore, it feels really good. Matthew now uh, able to use Lady Tremaine to get some more lore, catch up to Matthew's eight here, um, and just a really great play. And as we mentioned, if Matthew is able to, to start going wide a bit here, dropping three, four, or five characters on the board, Joshua does not have any way to mass remove characters other than challenging. No, and Matthew's doing a great job at that because even the characters that he's Exerting. Joshua can challenge the Merlin Rabbit if he wants with Peter Pan Shadow, but Peter Pan Shadow only has two strengths. So the only thing that it can banish is a Madame Mim Snake, but the Madame Mim Snake would banish the Peter Pan Shadow in response to the challenge. Uh, but we do see the Perdita come out for Joshua, bringing that Cusco back into play. Just like we talked about earlier in the game, Cusco is going to be troublesome because you can think of Cusco as a little lore gainer. Like, he can exert every turn for really no um, detriment meant to you, and if the opponent challenges Cusco and banishes him, you can draw a card, but so long as Perdita's on board, all you have to do next turn is uh, exert the Perdita or quest with the Perdita and then bring the Cusco right back, and the problem just never seems to go away. I think Matthew is going to have to find an answer to this Perdita, uh, with, or else it's going to get out of control. Yeah, we're now seeing the payoff for putting that Cusco uh, in play early on turn two, getting it into his discard pile so we can bring it back and get another card off of it. And Matthew does exactly what we just said, playing the Madame Medusa, seeing the threat that Perdita will cause uh, using Madame Medusa's ability to banish Perdita in play. Madame Medusa can banish a card that has three strength or less when played. Uh, and so we go back to Matthew just building that wide board, spreading his characters out, questing with him every turn that he can, uh, and he is slowly catching up to Joshua and slowing Joshua down at the same time. Yeah, Joshua questing that Peter Pan's shadow again, picking up another two lore. Um, it's a bit of a race now. Um, Joshua, I, I'm sure, hoping to get another character with two or more lore on the board. Perhaps a Mufasa, uh, I know, is a card that he would love to draw into at this point. Um, and here we have a Pascal uh, going wide here, and a Piglet, and a Cinderella. So really going wide. Um, now, at this point, it's worth noting we are uh, beyond turn six. Uh, so Matthew... Um, able to ink a card, and then uh, we all know what happens on turn seven in Ruby decks. 
Yeah, I think Matthew is really looking to be prepared here if he can to completely banish all characters in play. Matthew could quest with all of his characters, gaining a total of five lore, bringing him up just past Joshua at 13, and then play the be prepared and pass the turn, uh, removing all of these characters for Joshua. I don't think Joshua has any cards in his hand, so he would draw a card off of the Cusco, and then he would draw a card for turn, and then that's all that he would have to work with. And we do see all of the characters being quested here. It's an indicator. Liam, do you think it's coming? I, I think that's what we in the business call an indicator, and here it is. Here it is, the Be Prepared. Absolutely. And, you know, when you're, when you're playing Ruby decks, uh, oftentimes I, I like to think of turn six and beyond as the second phase of the game, because that's when the Lady Tremains, the Madame Medusas, the Be Prepared, the Scars, all of that comes online, and now you really have to plan around those threats, where in the early game, you can be a little bit more aggressive and go wide. Yeah, and now Joshua is really just playing off whatever he draws off of the top of his deck. We see him play a Rapunzel and a Cusco, and I don't think this is the scariest thing that Joshua can be playing right now. I think Matthew has an ability to answer it with things like a Madame Medusa we see being played, banishing the Rapunzel, also playing a Rafiki that he can use to challenge the Cusco when played. Joshua draws another Cusco to play, uh, and they're going to gain a couple lore. They're also going to give Joshua another card when Matthew decides to challenge with them, if he decides to challenge with them, or instead maybe decides to race. He's building quite a big board. Oh, that yeah. mini match style of surfer is such a good play here with two lore on the board. Um, I think that puts uh, player two, I think that puts game on the board right now, uh, forcing Joshua to respond uh, to Matthew's board state. Otherwise, Matthew takes the game next turn. Yeah, Joshua has to ch uh, challenge and banish one of Matthew's characters if he wants to keep Matthew from winning next turn. And even then, only, if you only take out one lore, we've said it multiple times across this two days, all Matthew needs is a Merlin Goat. You mm -hmm. could, he could get to 19 lore, play Merlin Goat, and then that would be game. And there's just not a lot of removal. So Joshua double challenging with the Kuzco's, uh, challenging and banishing Rafiki, um, sending it to the discard pile and buying himself another turn, playing a snake uh, to bounce Kuzco and bring Kuzco back onto the board, um, giving him three lore on board. Yeah, and we see Matthew just pushing his lore lead, questing with Minnie Mouse, Madame Medusa, and Rabbit. Currently, Joshua does not have an evasive character on board, which means he's going to have a really difficult time dealing with this Minnie Mouse, also playing a snake that's going to stay ready, so it's going to be especially difficult for Joshua to answer that because Amber Steel doesn't have great answers for readied characters. No, no, it does not. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a bind. Um, passing it back to Josh. We'll see if he can draw anything that can answer this board state. Um, and it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, it looks like Matthew has taken game one of this final series. He came out swinging. He came out aggressive, just like we said. I should have said, let's get down to business, man. Oh, I completely yes. missed that oh, one. Oh, my goodness. Uh, how did we, how did how we did not we use that line this? all weekend? I have no idea. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's okay. We're here in the finals. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Chernobog's minions immediately in the inkwell to play another Chernobog's minions. Pretty strong start from Joshua. Just, yeah, it's nice to see that one cost. Nice to open up with a character on the play, especially a character that can both gain you a lore and draw you a card if you want to. Absolutely. It's a, it's a great little versatile card, and it's even better when you know that in the later game you can get it back again. So um, it's a great card that Josh wants to get on the board. And So this is an opening that we saw in the semifinals also. Chernobog's minion serving multiple functions for Joshua here. Uh, one, it can draw him a card if he'd like and get him a lore. Um, it going to his discard pile and being able to, to bring it back later. But two, it kind of serves as a Rafiki counter where Matthew now can't use his Rafiki to gain lore um, in perpetuity. Uh, Joshua able to challenge that Rafiki and remove it for free. Yeah, and it looks like uh, that's exactly what Joshua does. He quests with it, and then Rafiki should be able to challenge and banish the Chernobog's followers. So we'll see if he does that and what he follows up with, because if Matthew's holding on to something like a Mad Mim Snake, um, he may not be able to take that line. He might actually have to leave the Chernobog's followers there, quest with the Rafiki, and then play the Mad Mim Snake just to get a two-drop on board, because uh, you can't play Mad Mim Snake unless you can bounce a character back to your hand. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Again, we, we see a Kuzco on turn two, and both of these cards, you know, as we highlighted last game, uh, Kuzco and Shredderbox followers are cards that you like to see on the board uh, multiple times if you can, and Perdita allows Joshua to do that. So um, in the early game here, one of the things Joshua is, is figuring out is what do I want to put into my discard pile uh, to feed my Perdita later uh, when she comes into play? And so that's part of this early game plan, and Joshua getting two cards, I think, that he's very happy to bring back here. Absolutely, and I think this is really an interesting play for Matthew. Rather than challenging the Trinobog followers with his Rafiki, and the Rafiki being banished from challenging the Trinobog followers, he instead ekes the Madame M Snake, develops a Cusco, and passes the turn. Yeah, he's definitely playing a more control line, probably leaving that Rafiki ready uh, to challenge uh, a stronger character if that becomes available. Um, but here it allows Joshua to quest again with the Trinobug's followers, and Joshua is now going to banish it uh, to draw a card, activating that ability. Um, and getting an additional card. Yeah, and Joshua deciding not to exert the Cusco uh, or quest with the Cusco, knowing that the Rafiki is still there and can challenge the Cusco. Rafiki wouldn't be banished in the challenge because Cusco only has one strength while Rafiki has two willpower. So uh, Joshua can't quite push his lore lead yet with that Rafiki staring down Joshua's board. But now this fairy godmother being on the board is interesting. You know, this is the small fairy godmother, 3-4, uh, decently statted uh, with one lore, but it's a shift target for the Floodborne, uh, Floodborne Grandmother, which has an awesome ability giving uh, your characters a challenger, and then if they're banished in a challenge, they go back to your hand. Yeah, it's especially great because she is a shift character, which means, and she only shifts her two at that, mm -hmm. so you can shift the Fairy Godmother, and her ability activates on quest, so you would be able to quest with Fairy Godmother the turn that Fairy Godmother is shifted onto the little one, uh, like Liam just said, giving everything challenger plus three, and then bouncing back to hand when banished in a challenge. We've seen so many cards that Joshua has played that benefit from being in play and being banished in play. So being able to bring them back into your hand to just replay them immediately uh, can create a lot of value in that scenario. For cards like Kuzco sitting on board, which can which can uh, get a little bit stronger challenge into Matthew's characters, uh, get a card and then return to your hand. Absolutely. We see Matthew thinking through his turn three play really hard. Uh, this, ma this match is untimed. It is the finals, so we want to give these players enough time to think through the correct plays, the best play lines that they have. We see him questing with the Cusco and then using a Madame M Fo or playing a Madame M Fox to bounce the Cusco back to hand so that Josh or Joshua cannot challenge the exerted Cusco. It's really, really fascinating watching this game play out. These players, both at the top of their game, with decks they know very well, um, trying to think through the, the ideal lines of play. And interestingly, you know, normally you want, one of these players wants to be the aggressor. They're trying to figure out who the aggressor is. Here, neither one has been able to take really an aggressive line, each putting characters on board to kind of match the other one and leaving them staring at each other across the field. Yeah, absolutely. We talked about how strong Cusco can be just because it's a character that you can usually quest with and you're fine with that, it being banished and drawing you a card, um, and then bringing it back with something like Perdita. Uh, Joshua may not have a Perdita in hand, and also that Rafiki just sitting there is threatening making very favorable trades into the Cusco, and just in the opposite sense, Joshua has that fairy godmother sitting there that can make pretty favorable trades as well into Matthew's board, uh, and so we're sort of at a stalemate here. We do see Joshua decide to exert the Cusco and offer up the challenge to Matthew if Matthew wants to take it. Madam and Fox now singing friends from the other side. Friends on the other side is such a great card in Amethyst. We've seen it since set one, um, and it simply says draw two cards. It's probably... <laughs> no strings attached. Yeah, no strings attached. You just get to draw two cards, probably one of the stronger Amethyst cards printed because, I mean, having more cards than your opponent is pretty good. Four cards is better. It's nice to have friends. It is amazing to have friends, <laughs> and Amethyst has plenty of them. <laughs> Looks like the players are trying to clear something up. Matthew's trying to ask a question to our judges. 
and again, which, which is fantastic. I have to kudos to our judges uh, who are sitting here making sure everything's going right. You know, when you play uh, games at this level um, and these stakes are on the line, it's nice to, to be confident that everything in ha is happening in the game according to the rules um, and that you're comfortable that it was a, it was a fair game. So having the judges there uh, to ask questions, uh, these really professional judges who know the rules inside and out, to ask these questions of uh, is really nice. Yeah, absolutely. It's always nice to have them handy to clear up rules that you don't know because although we all love this game, there's some very intricate interactions that can happen and not all of us know all of those intricate inter interactions and the judges have uh, decided to learn those things for us so that they can help us play this game to our best ability. We do see Matthew playing this Cusco that he bounced back earlier with the Madame M. Fox. Looks like he considered challenging with the Rafiki there, um, thinking about whether to remove that Cusco or not, um, and now thinking, thinking second thoughts. You know, it's, it's so fast. When you play these games, you know, especially at this level, um, there it is challenging the Cusco, uh, Cusco then allowing Joshua to draw a card. Um, you come to these turns sometimes where you have two different directions you could go, two different plays you can make, which will take your next few turns in wildly different paths. And so sometimes in the mid game here, um, it doesn't seem like there's a lot on the line, but the players are thinking so carefully about which way they want, you know, the, their subsequent turns to go. Um, and so you agonize over those decisions sometimes, even when uh, you're far away from 20 lore and the game is far from over. Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite things about this and Lorcana is just how intricate this game can be. The core rules are relatively simple to pick up. They're easy to learn, but the actual gameplay itself can be very complex. And something as simple as challenging the Cusco with the Rafiki on this turn or inking certain cards instead of others can make or break these games. They can come back to bite you later in the game when you need a specific card that you put in your inkwell or decided to make a trade that you shouldn't have because now Joshua can challenge and banish the Rafiki and you might need the Rafiki later to have challenged something more threatening. Here we have Joshua questing, scooping up Allure with that rabbit. We see a very uh, familiar play, questing with the rabbit, bouncing the rabbit back to hand with Madame M. Fox, doing the nice uh, Merlin Mim chase that we see in yeah. the movies. <laughs> It was a chase, uh, it, was, it was a card combo uh, so obvious and that they put it in the starter deck uh, so that we could all play with it and ca players have carried it from that starter deck into tournament play and we see it played out here. Followed by a piglet. Uh, piglet, a card with one lore, uh, but it gets plus two lore if there are two other characters on the board, turning it from a, a relatively inconsequential card to a scary card pretty quickly. Yeah, especially because um, Joshua has the ability to play quite a few characters at once. Uh, he plays a couple expensive cards, but right now the Madame and Fox is Exerted. So even if Matthew decides to challenge the Madame and Fox with his Madame and Fox um, and remove that so that Piglet no longer has two lore, all Joshua has to do is play a second character that next turn and Piglet's got that two lore right back again. But instead, it looks like Matthew in, uh, sings Friends on the Other Side with Madame and Fox and then finds a Merlin Crab, decides to play Merlin Crab, which would give his Cusco Challenger plus three, allowing him a challenge for four total strength so that you can banish the Madame and Fox, which is really important because you would rather trade with your Cusco than you would your own Madame and Fox. When Cusco's banished, Matthew gets to draw a card, um, and that Madame and Fox gets to stay in play with all of that strength, four strength on Madame and Fox, so that if Joshua decides to challenge the Madame and Fox to banish it with something like his fairy godmother, uh, the fairy godmother will also be banished in that challenge. Hey, absolutely. Crab, a really versatile card, which allows you to do some, some shenanigans like that, um, some tricks, and uh, definitely using it to maximum effect here. You know, the fox, uh, not only is it a stronger character to have on the board, but, it, but it's important to, to keep for a couple reasons. One, it is a singer for cards like Friends on the other side. We've seen two played, but there could be others. But two, um, you can do weird things like fox loops, where you bounce foxes for other foxes doing challenges and stuff. So um, giving you a little more utility on the board than Cusco. Absolutely. It is a, um, a package that we see play in Amethyst all the time, just for those reasons that you just mentioned, being able to pick up and put down characters. But I mean, even the utility of something like Madame and Fox having Rush, being able to challenge immediately while using the crab to give something challenger or pick up the rabbit to draw a bunch of cards or pick up the goat to gain a bunch of lore. There's just a ton of utility in that package, and it makes total sense why it's in just about every Amethyst build that we see. 
Yeah, here's a fun little play. Uh, this is one we highlighted last game where we mused about whether there were Cinderella's in this deck, but here, Fairy Godmother has one ability which allows you to exert an opponent's character when a Cinderella comes into play. Um, and lo and behold, Joshua plays a Cinderella to exert Merlin Crab and then challenge with the Fairy Godmother uh, to remove the crab, leaving her with one remaining willpower. So a fun little combo there and probably one that we haven't seen a tournament play terribly often. And here it is in the finals of the first uh, North American Morcana Challenge. And you know, one thing that I think I'm just now noticing about Joshua's deck list, I'm not sure that Joshua plays any actual songs. So I think that this Cinderella is purely in here to combo with the Fairy Godmother I think that's right. using her ability, um, which is really interesting, but makes sense. He's playing a Mufasa, or he's playing a deck that plays four Mufasas, playing a deck that plays four Perditas, and he is playing one Chernobox follower. So it is a very challenger heavy, or sorry, character heavy deck where you want characters in your discard pile. You don't want to be hitting anything other than characters off of those Mufasas when the Mufasas get banished. So it's just a pretty interesting thing there that he decides to run the combo of Cinderella and Fairy Godmother, and it seems to be working for him. It definitely worked here, and, you know, Cinderella to one cost can be uh, brought back from the discard pile with Perdita, perhaps allowing you to do that combo several times, so um, it's, a, it's a fun little trick. We do see Joshua finally taking a little bit of board control here, uh, removing some of what Matthew was working with. Matthew deciding to ink a Minnie Mouse Stylish Surfer and banishing the piglet in a challenge. Can't let that piglet continue to gain lore. It's got too much lore. Also going to play Madame and Medusa to get rid of that uh, Merlin rabbit. You don't want that rabbit bouncing around, drawing a bunch of cards for Joshua if you can help it. No, as you said last game, Brandon, yeah, or we talked about earlier, uh, the rabbit, it does feel bad banishing the rabbit, giving your opponent a card. But if you give your opponent a card off of it and they've gotten two cards off the rabbit, that is the, the minimum they can get. Um, if they do some bounce shenanigans and draw multiple cards, uh, it feels even worse. So removing it is probably the best option. Absolutely. And uh, when the rabbit leaves, the rabbit comes back. Uh, so many rabbits. Joshua just has another that he's able to play to draw another card. And he will use the Cinderella to finish off the Madame M. Fox, getting it out of play. Now, we talked about last game how we moved uh, into a second phase of the game, uh, I think, with Ruby when we get to turn six. And here, uh, just like we talked about Matthew hitting his uh, one of his six-cost removal cards with Madame Medusa. So now, uh, on Matthew's next turn, the removal options are really going to open up, and we're at a point in the game where Joshua has to think a little bit more carefully about what he's putting on the board and making vulnerable. Yeah, uh, Liam, has the stream frozen or something? I could have sworn that just a couple turns ago, um, Matthew got rid of the piglet and the rabbit, and they continue to still be on the screen somehow. I, I, there's just <laughs> looks like every there's, time... There's a glitch in the Matrix. Yeah, there's a glitch in the Matrix. Matthew continues to remove these characters and Joshua just seems to have them to play again except this time he does get a Pascal. Pascal will of course have evasive because there's another character in play and uh, Pascal and Piglet sort of play off of each other. They each care about other characters being in play. Pascal having evasive, Piglet gaining extra lore. We do see Matthew play another Medusa to get rid of that rabbit saying, "You did it. I did it once and I'll do it again. I don't want you drawing any extra cards off of this rabbit. I do think these these might be key plays down the road because uh, this deck, I think, Joshua's deck, has a lot of cards that are low cost and it has the ability to go wide, but at the cost of cards in your hand. And without those rabbits and being able to use them to maximum effect, I think this deck could stall out. So getting rid of those rabbits could uh, pay off. But here we have the Mufasa, which he failed to find in game one. Mufasa, uh, just a great card, uh, two lore on the board, so it can, it can quest and get you closer to victory. But more importantly, when it's banished in a challenge uh, and goes to your discard pile, you can look at the top card of your deck, and if it's a character card, you can put it in play for free. Yeah, it is a really strong card, especially in a, a deck that is so character heavy and plays quite a few characters that you'd like to see in play. Playing those, we've talked about the Cusco's, the Piglets, gaining a bunch of lore, even something like a Rapunzel. If a Rapunzel gets pulled off of the top and you have a damaged character, you can immediately heal something and draw a bunch of cards. So um, also another fun interaction here is the Madame Mim thing as well. If you pull a Madame Mim Snake or a Madame Mim Fox off of the top of your deck, then you can bounce one of your maybe exerted characters that are vulnerable uh, that Matthew decided not to challenge if he decides to get rid of the Mufasa first. Uh, so Mufasa, I think, is a really great card in this deck for those reasons. Uh, one thing I have to correct, I, I did think, I misspoke and said that Mufasa has to be banished in a challenge for that to work. It's not, it's banished, period. Oh, uh, yeah, um, banished at all. Yeah, which which is one of the reasons it's so popular, um, because when you're playing a deck, for example, uh, with Be Prepared, and your opponent clears the board, that leaves you immediately with a character on the board, um, allowing you to b b build your board state faster than your opponent. Yeah, that's why I love the Mufasa plays in board states like this. Joshua is putting a lot of pressure on 
on Matthew right now with both the Piglet, the Pascal, and then decides to play Mufasa because he's building a wide board, knowing that Matthew has enough ink to play a Be Prepared, and it's uh, Matthew is incentivized to play a Be Prepared right now to get rid of all of these characters, but he also knows that that will come at the cost of banishing the Mufasa and potentially drawing something off the top to immediately be put into play. Um, so. Luckily for Matthew, the Piglet and the Pascal are exerted. Of course, he can't challenge the Pascal because the Pascal has evasive, but he can banish that Piglet that has three lore and has been pushing Joshua closer and closer to 20. I mean, Joshua is already halfway to his win condition. Joshua here taking a look at the cards in his discard pile, spreading them out, showing both Matthew uh, and himself what's in there. Uh, this is important for a variety of reasons. One is the Perdita we talked about, which can pull cards back. But the other, um, as we mentioned earlier and you saw uh, in previous rounds, there's one copy of Chernabog uh, in this deck, which cares about characters in your discard pile because it makes it a lot cheaper to play. Yeah, and I'll be honest, Chernabog would be quite a difficult card for Matthew to take care of. Ruby has a lot of ways to outright banish characters, but in Matthew's deck list, there's only about six cards that can actually outright banish, or not even banish, or just get rid of the Chernabog. He's running three Be Prepareds, which of course he can use to do that, but we've already talked about how the Mufasa on board makes that a pretty difficult play or tricky play if we do see a Chernabog come out. He's also playing a couple Yzma, um, sorry, uh, what? Scary Beyond All Reason. Scary Beyond All Reason, thank you, Liam, uh, mm -hmm. that you can choose a character and shuffle that character back into the player's deck and then that player draws two cards. That would be another way to get rid of the Trinobog. Um, or he is, Matthew's also playing a single copy of Lady Tremaine, which uh, your opponent has to choose a character to banish when Lady Tremaine is played. So you would have to have just Trinobog on Joshua's board in order to even do that. So not a ton of options for Matthew if that is in the cards. I'm not sure if Joshua has that in his hand or not or if we're anywhere close to that, but something to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Joshua here questing for three uh, with two characters. One that he doesn't mind losing terribly much in the Mufasa and two, uh, the Pascal, which is, should be fairly safe from a challenge. Yeah, the fun thing about Mufasa is it's just sort of teasing or tempting Matthew to say, you need to banish me, but I know you don't want to banish me. I'm going to continue to gain two lore every turn that you allow me to until you banish me. And then when you do, uh, I'm going to benefit off of it. Now, this is a very aggressive play, and it's a little bit risky because what it's opened up for Matthew is the ability to challenge the Mufasa, get the card off the top deck, and then play a Be Prepared, leaving Mufasa not there um, on the board to get a character back when the, when the board is wiped. So um, here uh, is exactly what Matthew's doing, is banishing Mufasa, bringing back a Perdita, which immediately uh, gives him the effect of pulling a character of two costs or less uh, back from the discard pile to play, Joshua choosing Cusco, a card that will get him a card when it's banished. So now Matthew has the ability to play the Be Prepared without triggering the Mufasa. Joshua, of course, knew this and chose to pursue the lore, getting him to 15, um, knowing that this was an option and deciding at this moment to strike, um, and I think really push his lore total. Yeah. This is one of those situations where he's telling Matthew, you either have it or you don't. If you don't have it, I take this game and we go on to game three. If you do have it, then I think that's why he chose the Cusco in his discard rather than something like the Piglet, because if Matthew decides to play Be Prepared, both the Rabbit and the Cusco uh, would be banished, and both of those would draw a card off of the Be Prepared, uh, giving Joshua some more cards in hand. And we do see that Be Prepared being played after Matthew played a Madame M Snake, and I miss what, what he picked up. What did he pick uh, up He there? picked up a Madame Medusa. Okay, took, there we go. Yeah, he, definitely he, he, makes sense just keeping yep, another it. answer uh, for whatever Joshua has to play after this so here we are clean slates over to Joshua to rebuild the board yeah having refilled his hand just a little bit like we mentioned earlier with the Cusco and the rabbit we'll see what he drew into we see another Mufasa coming in alongside a Cusco and a Cinderella man Joshua just refills his board so quickly so quickly playing the Mufasa and of course Joshua knows that the Madame Medusa is over there um, and able to banish something but playing the Mufasa saying you can remove it uh, and, and try your luck yep try it again we'll see what we pull off the top Joshua checking Matthew's discard right now probably seeing how many removal options Matthew might still have because uh, this is sort of a game of attrition. Uh, Joshua is going to continue to play characters that continue to bring back characters or bring other characters into play that he doesn't have to play for or that he doesn't have to pay for. Um, and Matthew is going to have to remove them, especially because Joshua has such a lore lead on Matthew right now. Matthew doesn't have the luxury of keeping these characters in play and letting him quest too much because, I mean, Joshua is an amethyst and we know what card is an amethyst. Uh, it's the goat. <laughs> it is the goat. <laughs> it's the goat. 
And that's the thing, you know, when you look at these Amethyst decks that run Goats, especially Goat Bounces, you know, 20 lore is the win condition, but, but 18 is really kind of the danger area. Uh, 17 even, 17, 18, 19. So uh, Joshua's looking to push his lure there, and at that point, if we can just draw the game out, he'll eventually draw into a goat, which he can use to win the game. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that Matthew has to keep in mind. Um, and we see him trying to slow down Joshua a little bit by playing the rabbit, also playing the Mount of Medusa to uh, banish some of Joshua's characters. And we see Joshua, I mean, it just makes sense. He's pushing his lore. He's so close to 20. He wants to get as close as he can, keeping the aggression on Matthew, trying to finish out this game. Oh, okay, this is an interesting play. Joshua playing the Peter Pan Shadow, which has evasive, uh, and Matthew is gonna really struggle to be able to get rid of this. Joshua is showing game on board with a total of uh, four, five, six lore total, so Matthew would need to get rid of four lore on the board, which is gonna be difficult because some of that four lore is a Mufasa carrying two of it. We know that if Mufasa gets banished, then another character is likely to come into play also. Yeah, absolutely. Peter Pan's Shadow, we talked before about the versatility, giving your, your rush characters evasive. Um, but here it's serving as a lore battery. Uh, it has two lore um, and uh, just one more two lore character for Matthew to deal with. Um, really looking for another be prepared here probably um, is, is his best option. Yeah, and even after a be prepared, Joshua's going to turn a card over off the top of his deck and play it immediately. Matthew thinking really hard about his lines, what his outs are, seeing how he needs to play this turn to save this game. Matthew starts by challenging the Cusco, banishing it, and uh, picking the rabbit back up with Madam Snake, I imagine, to uh, draw a card, see if he draws into an answer. He can also play the rabbit again to draw another card to try to find another answer to just slow Joshua down a little bit. Unfortunately, you play Rabbit one more time, you draw another card. Even if you ink this turn, you have five. Most of your removal options are at six. So really, at this point, forced to use whatever he has in his hand. Uh, banishing Pan's Shadow there, but still leaving three lore on the board, um, which is enough to close out the game. Here goes Madame Medusa into Fox, removing that one lore. Now you have Mufasa standing alone um, with two lore, not able to close out the game on his own, um, but still... Uh, getting you that much closer. Yeah, Matthew had to get rid of that Peter Pan Shadow first because Madame M. Fox has Rush and Peter Pan Shadow gives your Rush characters evasive. So uh, it was nice for him to, it was nice for Matthew to have that Madame Medusa to get rid of the Peter Pan Shadow, remove the evasive from Madame M. Fox so then he could challenge it with his other Madame Medusa that he had played previously uh, and remove that from board, leaving just the Mufasa, which can only quest for two. But like we've said, uh, if Joshua finds something like a Merlin Goat, that's all that it's going to take to end this game. We see Matthew playing a Maleficent Sorcerer, which lets him draw a card when he is played. Um, and that is all of his ink, I believe. So he's deciding whether what he wants to do with the rest of his turn. He's just going to pass. We'll see what Joshua picks up here. He immediately quests for two with Mufasa. It doesn't seem like he has a goat in hand. Otherwise, I imagine we would have seen it already. Okay, and Joshua is just going to play a little bit wide, force Matthew to get rid of all of these characters, which is going to be a little tough. Matthew could do this again with the same way he did before, challenging the Mufasa, seeing what Mufasa pulls off the top, and then playing a Be Prepared if he has it to completely uh, wipe Joshua's board. We see him challenge the Mufasa with the Mount of Medusa, pull off a Fairy Godmother off of the top. Nice she to does the top enter deck. exerted. I think Matthew has 11 ink total, so he can play four ink worth of cards before uh, he has to have the Be Prepared to play. And there, and there it is. is. The be prepared. He had it. He had the be prepared. Uh, we'll see if he has anything else 
in his hand. He still has a couple ink, I believe, that he could at least develop something, get it on board before Joshua is able to play other things as well. And we see he decides to play Merlin Rabbit, draw a card, and uh, just dig a little bit deeper into his deck, hopefully keeping or finding some answers for whatever Joshua is about to play next. You know, this game is close. It's still not unwinnable for Matthew, believe it or not. You know, you always play to your outs. Uh, Matthew here doing exactly that, putting things on the board, drawing another card. Um, there's a lot of removal options, you know, that Ruby has available. And so um, he has an answer for single characters that are dropped on the board and, and several of the be prepareds. Of course, you know, we keep talking about the goat and how important uh, the goat is to this deck. But for all we know, all four goats could be stacked onto the bottom uh, of this deck just due to bad luck. Um, and so um, always play to your outs. And this, this game is still, is still in play. It's definitely happened before, and we see where Joshua's deck shines here, being to feel like constantly play wide. All he had to do here was play a Perdita. He immediately can bring a Cusco back into play, and now Matthew doesn't just have to take care of one character. He has to take care of two, and uh, Matthew is eventually going to run out of beef repairs. He's already played quite a few Madame Medusas, and since these characters are ready, it's going to be our Perdita and Cusco specifically are ready. It makes it that much harder for Matthew to interact with him and banish them before Joshua goes to the next turn because all Joshua needs is a single readied character that has lore and can quest uh, in order to win this game on the next turn. So we see a Mad another Madame Medusa come down to banish the Perdita, leaving the Cusco. Matthew still has to get rid of this. And the talk, the only two cost card, exactly the right amount of ink uh, to exert that character, uh, making it challengeable, um, and Rabbit coming across there and taking care of Cusco, uh, giving Joshua a card, though, however, in the process. Yeah, I mean, I have to give props to Matthew here. He is playing this match perfectly. He's finding his outs. He's finding the lines. He's creating a lot of pressure. He has a ton of cards on board. Joshua's deck struggles a lot to play against a wide board. And if Matthew can delay this game by just a few turns, Matthew might be able to actually swing this in his favor. Currently showing five lore on the board. Pass it back to Joshua. But as you suggested earlier, you know, you only have so many answers. Um, so every time Joshua is able to drop two characters on board, uh, it's just really difficult. A lot of the answers available to Matthew right now, other than be prepared, are, are spot removal. We'll, we'll banish a single card. Um, and so you have to, pending multiple of those a turn uh, is a little tricky. Yeah. You can always pick up his Madame Medusa and play it if he has a bounce character again using the resources, uh, recycling them, which is something that Amethyst does really well. But it looks like Matthew does not have the answer, and Joshua is going to take game two. Guys, we have a game three finals match. And I have no... Let's get down to business. Let's get down to, to business. business. To win the Disney Lorcana Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't roll off the tongue. It doesn't. Quite, we'll quite we'll have to well. perfect that for next time. Yeah, we'll have to practice, I guess. All right, both players still aren't altering their hands here. You know, one thing we've, we've mentioned earlier is how important this phase of the game is, uh, choosing what to keep in your opening hand and what to discard. Games can be won or lost uh, right here uh, in this stage of the game. I think it's one of the most under-appreciated um, points of Disney Lorcana. A lot of players understand uh, about board state and how trades work and resources and efficiency, but the mulligan system in Lorcana is so generous that you have the benefit of being able to put back any card that you want from your opening hand and draw that many cards back up to seven. So if there are certain cards that are really strong in a matchup or really important that you need in a matchup, in this case, we've talked about the Mufasa, Peter Pan Shadow, something like Minnie Mouse Surfer, uh, even Madame Medusa, um, you can put back the cards that you know you don't need and dig really deep up to seven. Uh, you can essentially go 14 cards deep into your deck before the game even starts if you want to. Um, and like you said, I think games can be made or broken purely on how aggressive or uh, not aggressive you decide to mulligan. And here we go, Matthew, uh, on, on the play here, going first, opening up with a Rafiki. Probably not his ideal opening. I think he probably would be looking for something like a Pascal, being on the play, wanting to get a bit of an aggressive start. But at least the Rafiki sitting there will be able to um, 
hopefully keep Joshua from questing with any of his characters. We do see the Rafiki being quested with here. It's partially because Cinderella cannot challenge and banish Rafiki. Cinderella only has one strength, and Rafiki has two willpower. No, that's right. I actually think Cinderella is not the ideal opening for Joshua here. I think Joshua would much prefer to have one of his Chernobog followers, giving him the versatility to draw a card off of it or to challenge that Rafiki. Um, Cinderella in here, uh, as a one-cost character that can come back, uh, there's nothing to sing. Uh, there's no songs, uh, but also as a, as a card that works with Fairy Godmother, but um, a, a turn one play, uh, but probably not the one he wanted to see. Yeah, and we see Matthew doing something that Amethyst does really well. We've seen it all the time, playing your one-cost character, questing with that character, bouncing the character back, and Joshua follows suit, doing the exact same thing with Cinderella, snakes staring at each other. Across the board. So here, Matthew, uh, questing for one, saying, all right, Joshua, you need to respond to me. I'm going to be the aggressor. If you want to banish my snake, you can, uh, but I'm not going to let you get free lore and quest. Uh, so Matthew here definitely showing that he's, he's going to take the more aggressive line uh, if it's available to him. Yeah, especially when you're oh. on the play um, and you are the first person that can play something like a Mad Mim Snake. Yours is going to drive before your opponent's. It's very advantageous for you to quest like this because now Joshua has a decision to make. He can decide, okay, do I continue to put pressure as well and try to match Matthew in this lore race by questing with my Madame M Snake and developing characters further? Or do I make this trade with his Madame M Snake to keep him from gaining any more lore? And we see him making that trade, playing the Fairy Godmother, which I kind of like here because the Fairy Godmother has great stats for a card. It is an inkable three cost, three, four, which will trade favorably into this Madame M Snake. It's only a three, three. So the, uh, the Fairy Godmother will survive with one willpower left. Absolutely. The math here, very much in Joshua's favor. As you suggest, you know, with Matthew uh, taking the more aggressive approach here, you know, he'd probably like to quest for that snake if he could, but um, unfortunately, uh, Fairy Godmother shutting that down. So it's a perfect example of, you know, Matthew having a game plan, hoping to, to quest here, and Joshua shutting that down with just a well-statted character at the appropriate time. And here we see this combo again. Yeah. Um, with Cinderella coming down, uh, activating uh, the uh, ability on Fairy Godmother, which says, when a Cinderella is played, you may exert an opponent's character. So exerting the rabbit here, making it vulnerable to a challenge. I think this is a really huge play. Dare I say, maybe game winning. And I know that sounds really dramatic, but being able to exert this rabbit and deny Matthew the value that comes from having a rabbit and being able to bounce the rabbit back and forth, drawing a bunch of cards. We saw in the last game how much Matthew had to dig and draw cards to find answers to Joshua's board state. And so the fact that Matthew only was able to play the rabbit, get the one draw off of it, not even be able to quest with it, and Joshua able to deny all of that value that I'm sure Matthew was looking to get from the rabbit. Being, and then on top of that, being able to play the Madam and Fox, bounce the Cinderella back so that you can do that again. again. And a, a challenge with the Madam and Fox that still survives the challenge against rabbit. I mean, I feel like that was a huge tempo shift for Joshua here. Absolutely. Having that Cinderella back in the hand, you know, now Matthew has to think about that. Anything that he plays uh, right now is vulnerable uh, to be challenged. Although, Matthew says, all right, uh, turnabout is fair play here. I'll exert your character, making it vulnerable. And perhaps uh, we see a fox uh, of his own here. I really like this play because I feel like we are seeing two sides of the same coin. We talked earlier about how Joshua isn't playing the Pin Pinocchio talkative puppet, which would do the same thing as this fairy godmother Cinderella play of being able to exert a character when you want to. Um, so we see both of those options happening and so Matthew exerts the fairy godmother we'll see if he decides to challenge into it and if he has something that he can uh, else something else he can challenge with it to banish it And it does look like he had a Madame M. Fox that he could play to challenge and get rid of this fairy godmother, knowing that Joshua was holding on to that Cinderella uh, and knowing that that was going to be a real problem for Matthew. Like you mentioned earlier, Liam, not being able to really play anything of value because you knew it was going to be able to be exerted by that Cinderella and fairy godmother combo. So remember how we talked about how the Mufasa is probably key in the mid-match and... Oh. <laughs> uh, key to the mid-match here, because once the options open up on turn six, Matthew can start removing things, has some really good removal, and having that Mufasa to replace itself with something off the top of the deck feels really good. Uh, what you don't necessarily like to see is the Pascal, um, a card that doesn't give you a ton of value for that Mufasa. 
uh, when it's removed. But nonetheless, uh, able to quest here. It gets evasive because Joshua plays a couple Cuscos. Um, so getting a lore, um, but probably would have liked to see something bigger. Now, one of the risky things about Mufasa is that it can be a really strong card. It can play cards from the top of your deck that have very strong interplay abilities. Uh, sometimes it misses like this and plays a Pascal. And the most risky part about it is every of, every one of those cards interplay exerted. And so Pascal, of course, only has evasive when there are other characters on board. There, of course, were not any other characters on board. But luckily for Joshua, Matthew also didn't have any other characters on board or any rush characters that he could play to challenge the Pascal before Joshua was able to respond with two Cuscos, ensuring that Pascal stays safe with evasive and being able to use it to his full ability. But now, of course, we're reaching turn seven. So Joshua now, you know, thinking about what to play, but knowing that be prepared is an option. So uh, Joshua, of course, you know, would love to go wide at some point and push his lore total, uh, get closer to victory, but has to think about doing that in a, in a controlled manner, uh, knowing that the be prepared is coming. Of yeah, course wonder if the Mufasa came out a little early because we talked about this and we saw it in the previous match where Joshua was, able, Joshua was able to build quite a wide board and then around when turn seven came around when you're a little bit scared of a be prepared coming down you can play a Mufasa and say you can try to be prepared me but I'm immediately going to pull something off the top of my deck and play it and instead Joshua decides to play Merlin goat gaining a lore when it enters play. Maleficent coming into play, allowing Matthew to draw a card. And another talkative puppet, exerting Merlin Goat, making it vulnerable to a challenge, and uh, we'll likely see uh, perhaps Madame Medusa come in here and remove that goat so that Joshua doesn't get any more value out of it. Yeah, and this is where uh, Merlin Goat's stats come into play, like you had mentioned earlier. The fact that Merlin Goat has four strength and banishes the Mount of Medusa when it is challenged, although you're happy to see the Merlin Goat be banished and get off of Joshua's board so that Joshua doesn't get any more value out of it, it does... It feels really bad for Matthew to have to trade his Mount of Medusa. Uh, he won't be able to bounce the Mount of Medusa back to hand, and that's at least one that is down that he's not going to have an answer for later in the game. Here we have Perdita, uh, another card allowing uh, Joshua to maximize the value of the cards in his deck. Pulling back a snake, uh, not a move we've seen before. A snake doesn't give you any effect when it enters or leaves play, but it's a very well-statted character. Um, and so a 3-3 now on the board uh, for free uh, with the Perdita play. Yeah, there's an interesting thing that happens when Perdita manages to bring Madame M. Snake back in that normally when Madame M. Snake is played, you have to bounce a character back to your hand or else the snake just becomes banished again. So you can do this really fun thing with Perdita where you pull the Madam M Snake back from the discard pile and play it, and that gives you an opportunity to take a card off of the board of yours for free back to your hand that's exerted, and we saw him do that with the Pascal. And we save it from the Be Prepared. And, yeah, and save it from the Be Prepared, exactly. We do see the Be Prepared come down from Matthew, clearing the board, resetting the game, uh, and this is honestly still a really tight race. Matthew is only at 6 lore, Joshua is at 10, but, I mean, comparatively, that's not super far off, and we do see Joshua come back and respond with the Bertita plus Cusco combo, one that we are getting familiar with the more we watch Joshua play this deck. Absolutely. What, what I love about what Joshua did there, uh, Joshua knows the Be Prepared is an option, and he's trying to put enough lore on the board that Matthew has to play it so that Joshua can then get into to the post-Be Prepared phase and start to rebuild his board. So he could have, uh, and there's a, another Be Prepared, <laughs> um, he could have in that first scenario used Perdita to pull back a Cusco or something else that got him some value, but instead he did pull back the Snake, bouncing a Pascal, just putting a little bit more lore on the board with Perdita and basically forcing that be prepared. Yeah, and the fact that Matthew's already down to be prepared uh, means that Joshua can play around a little bit riskier if he wants to. Joshua's doing a very, very great job of, like you mentioned earlier, putting just enough lore on board that Matthew has to play this be prepared. He's not overextending. He's playing just enough to put enough pressure so that uh, Matthew thinks about playing a be prepared but isn't getting a ton of value off of the be prepared. So, for instance, Matthew be prepared right now. Joshua's going to draw two cards off of the rabbit and the Cusco, and he's only taking two lore off of the board, but if he doesn't do anything or doesn't get rid of any of these cards, Joshua's gaining three lore a turn, and after two or three turns, that's going to get him dangerously close to 20 lore uh, and taking this match entirely. 
Yeah, this, this deck is, is really shining right now, and you can see what it's trying to do. With this amount of ink on the board, uh, every time the rabbit or the Kuzco is removed, it's, it, with a be prepared or anything else, giving Joshua two cards, he can probably play those two cards with enough resources. He has enough resources to do it. So every single turn, he's playing two or more characters, it feels like, forcing Matthew to respond with significant removal and not single character removal. And Matthew doing a great job as well, using this talkative puppet, the, the uh, Pinocchio talkative puppet as best as he can, playing it and then bouncing it immediately with the Merlin, or sorry, the Madame Mim Fox so that he can challenge. And now he has that talkative puppet back in hand to do it again if he needs to answer a threat. This is not the first time we've seen Rapunzel play for the lore alone. Uh, Rapunzel has a, a great ability um, allowing you to heal a character when it comes into play and drawing cards for each damage counter removed. But here being used purely as a lore generator, I, I believe, uh, getting out on the board and threatening two lore next turn. Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, Joshua is just doing a phenomenal job at putting just enough lore on board for it to matter, but not enough that... Uh, Matthew feels great about his options. We do see a Meta Medusa being played by Matthew, which will banish a character with three strength or less, and he chooses the Rapunzel with because the Rapunzel has two lore on it, the most lore out of any of the characters, just trying to sew Joshua down as much as possible, but Joshua just continues to tug along, or chug along, going up to 13 lore currently. Yep, and see, this is why that, that Rapunzel play was so big. Playing that character with two lore, forcing the Madame Medusa to respond to that, leaves the rabbit in play, where I'm sure Matthew would have much rather removed that um, if left to his own devices, because Joshua now getting extra value out of that rabbit, bouncing it to his hand, drawing a card, playing it again to draw a card, and giving him even more characters at his disposal uh, to flood the board. Yeah, and now it's getting really dangerous. Uh being able to bounce and replay the rabbit, like you mentioned, drawing cards, getting a piglet on board that will have plus two lore because there are two other characters on board. Right now, we're looking at a total of six lore in play on Joshua's side of the board. And we see Matthew using that talkative puppet again to exert the piglet that I'm sure he's planning to challenge. Oh, okay, so we see the Gizma being played on Matthew's own talkative First time. Uh, uh, Pinocchio talkative puppet. He knows that the talkative puppet has done a lot of work this game. It doesn't need to be banished. Um, this is a play that allows Matthew to draw two more cards, maybe bringing him closer to answers that he needs while making sure that that Pinocchio doesn't go into his discard so that hopefully he can draw into it again when he needs it to continue to slow Joshua down with the characters that he's playing. Yeah, Yzma is a very versatile card. We've seen it work into to a variety of lists here uh, once Into the Ink Lens came out. Um, it, it serves as card draw for you. It also serves as removal. Um, so in a pinch, you can remove something of your opponent's, perhaps a, a Shurnabog, um, send it back into your opponent's deck, but allowing them to draw two cards. But I think it's most often used uh, for card draw, because not only does it give you two cards, uh, but it also now has two lore, um, and it's a card you can use to drive your lore total a little bit. Man, the rabbits just do not stop. We see Joshua using one of his Merlin rabbits to banish the Madame Medusa and just playing another rabbit to draw another card. We see another piglet in play as well. Uh, this is just forcing Matthew to answer again, saying, you have to answer my board. Otherwise, I win next turn because uh, I, now I have, yeah, now still just six lore on board, seven lore on board currently, which will be plenty enough to get to 20 on the next turn. If Matthew can't answer, Matthew can't challenge the Pascal because Pascal has evasive. All other characters on Joshua's side of the board are readied, so Matthew's not going to be able to challenge them. I really think Matthew just has to have a be prepared here. Joshua deciding to quest with Madam M. Fox, knowing that if Matthew does challenge the Madam M. Fox with the Yzma, uh, it will also banish the Yzma, meaning that uh, the Yzma won't be able to banish or challenge or banish any of the other characters either. Now, this is, a, this is a difficult situation. As we mentioned, you know, most of the removal in Ruby uh, is spot removal, allowing you to remove uh, a single target or single character. Um, so another be prepared. Again, we always talk about how important it is, but... Again, another be prepared would be nice. Um, we'll see if, if Matthew is able to, to find it. He is. He does have the be prepared to save him and keep this game going. Liam, this is such a tight game for the championship. I'm on the edge of my seat. Matthew finding the answers he needs when he needs them. I've, even though Joshua is really close, I feel like this game still isn't over for Matthew.
No, definitely uh, still in play, but Joshua, two great answers here. You know, the rabbit, of course, getting a card uh, is always nice. Uh, you can quest for that rabbit next turn to get you a lure, but the Mufasa um, is a really rough card uh, for Matthew to see played here. Um, it has two lure, it can quest next turn, uh, but again, it's going to replace itself if Matthew manages to remove it. Maui coming into play uh, with Rush, but nothing exerted, so nothing uh, able to be challenged there. Yeah, I really like this Mufasa play from Joshua. It makes it so that even if Matthew's able to banish it, there's just another character that's going to have lore that's going to come on board. And we see Joshua playing quite a few characters out, saying, Matthew, you have to answer all of these. If not, I will win next turn. And, and there we does. have it. Wow. We have a Disney Lorcana Challenge champion. The finally. very first, very first in North America. Wow. And